if you're not progressing, one of two things is likely happening. You're under or overloading, right? You're overloading and under recovering, or you're chronically underloading and you're not actually providing enough stimulus to get stronger. Tips for improving ankle slash foot mobility. You have to be able to put your foot in a position where the bones can actually move. Most people, when you externally rotate, if I turn that this, I'm gonna supinate, which means like my arch is high. When my arch is high, my talus stays in front of my tibia. So I can't move my shin forward because this bone is in the way. What do you think about someone who's trying to progress at a bunch of things at once? If you're newer, it might be a good idea to write it down. And then also never underestimate the power of a coach. Like any skill, it's really frequency of that exposure at high quality, which is going to allow you to learn much faster. If you come across an Instagram profile that doesn't have like a designation, so like mine says Dr. Jordan Shallow DC, that means I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> But it's like, if you ever come across and there's just no, it's very <laughs> ambiguous. Like it's just Dr. So-and-so. And then it's either a chiropractor or a podiatrist. Like Dr. Paul Saladino. I don't know who, I don't know <laughs> who that is. Is he a chiropractor? <laughs> well, you know who Paul Saladino is? No. You're That's my favorite. favorite. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, That's really, I just work on the internet. I don't live there. Like, I love oh. that. That's even That's, better. How about Dr. Tony Huge? I don't know who that is. <laughs> but he's a lawyer. <laughs> I, but he, he, he's a doctor of law. I guess mm, so. so. Does that make him a lawyer though? <laughs> so he's Dr. Tony Esquire? Huge? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he would be a fun rabbit hole for you to go down. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I don't think you want to pull the pin out of that grenade. I don't know anything about the internet. Mm. Especially the That's YouTube good. world. Because you guys are you guys are crazy. Uh, YouTube scares the shit out of me. But you have a podcast. You're ready that to that go must go one? somewhere. Yeah, it goes on spot. It goes on our YouTube channel. I just don't know. It goes some some sort of internet somewhere. frequency. On, uh, yes, on the interwebs as a wise yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, just a heads up, we're about to go live. So Everything you say is now officially written in ink. That's good. Keep it all the same. So yeah. you're a doctor, oh, but you don't understand how the internet works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, do those things have to run in tandem? And I wait. don't know. Usually doctors can understand it. Like they usually have a large understanding of a lot of things, don't they? I don't know. That's why I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. So glad we clarified that at the job. <laughs> Low expectations, under promise, over Wait a second. Where'd you get this uh, Canadian? Uh, it was a, is this Canadian chiropractic thing or is it no, like I, I actual did, I did, United States? I did, chiro I did chiro school in the Bay Area. Oh, That's okay. why I moved out here okay. back in the day. I, I, love how I, have, I have no idea. I don't understand where to, I don't even yeah. know what, where to start with. Chiropractic. I don't know what a good school would be. Yeah, med school, a real one. I don't know. It's probably <laughs> they're probably all the same. I only went to one, but do you uh, utilize a lot of the things that you learned in school still today? Mm, I think from like an anatomy standpoint, you get like a really good detail. Like you have cadaver labs, like you're cutting open yeah. dead bodies. Like you're probably going to get from like a joint mechanics perspective and an anatomy perspective one of the better educations. Like my sister's a physician. She's like a she's a emergency room surgeon in Australia and. Damn. When she has musculoskeletal problems, like my phone rings because they spent two weeks in that mm -hmm. on her in her third year. So I think from an anatomy perspective, I wouldn't say, go as far to say biomechanics, but once you understand the anatomy and you start going into biomechanics, you can cross apply the principles. But that would be, I think, from a day to day basis, how I work now. If I thought back, I think, like, hmm, what do I actually use from school? It would probably be like joint mechanics and muscular anatomy. Mm. I guess uh, knowing the origin of where the muscle is inserted and how the muscle works and all those things probably are pretty good factors to know, just to know the jargon, I guess, right? Yeah, yes and no. Like, And I think some ways it's detrimental because like you quite literally learn dead guy anatomy, right? Where it's like, oh, if I were to like electrically stimulate this muscle on this cadaver, this bone would move towards this bone. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, that's kind of not how stuff actually works with like a nervous system that's you know, alive and mm. well. So it's in some ways it can be a little bit like uh, it leaves you chasing red herrings for a bit, but it, that fundamental understanding of like, oh, my bicep hurts. It's like, well, you might think it's your bicep, but it actually is the insertion of like your teres minor or something like that. So being able to look at someone and look underneath the skin sort of with x-ray vision and see all of the structures and know all the ligaments and all that, that's super useful because then you can just kind of broaden the understanding of potentially what could be going on. Mm. Like your list of differential diagnosis expands to include, you know, everything that could potentially be happening. Uh, thank you for joining us live. Uh, we're going to be answering some of your questions in a moment. We're here with Dr. Jordan Shallow. And uh, so how do you go from that, you know, background and how do you go from like chiropractic into working with some, I mean, you're working with some really high level performers, baseball, football, and so on. Uh, yeah, I, um, I mean, was always into sports growing up, played a lot, moved out to the Bay Area and just, I think I got, I volunteered as an athletic trainer for Palo Alto High School. Uh, and then from there kind of got into the football world, 
did some consulting with San Jose State University back in 2012, 13, like as I was finishing grad school and uh, worked with some of their guys going into combine and pro day, was a strength coach at Stanford University. Um, and then some of those guys went to the league, worked a bit with them, and then slowly just through word of mouth ended up working with more combine classes. Those guys went to the league, trained them in the off season. And then it's sort of just been like a snowball effect for the last mm. 10 years or so. Wow. With the combine stuff, is that, um, is it a little bit of like a trick? Like, cause you know, they're getting tested on like these certain things and then we want to try to, uh, like jip the test as much as we possibly can almost. <laughs> yeah. You want to money ball it for sure. And like, and a lot of different fronts, like you, you will get them early January. Uh, sometimes a little bit later if they play a national championship like UW and, and Michigan this year. We had a couple of guys come out of those programs. So you're, you really have a six-week window from getting someone off a national championship to getting them ready to run an in Indy. So it's like a lot of it is, yeah, a lot of it's statistics. A lot of it's like, okay, understanding the their past injuries, had a program for nine events, not a football game. It's literally like football CrossFit. Mm -hmm. That's what we're programming for. Okay, what are you really good at? Okay, you're already really fast. Maybe you don't even run a 40. Like there's a bit of strategy around mm. almost like almost like calling numbers for an Olympic weightlifting meet. It's like you want to be strategic of like, okay, you're going to do your run at a pro day a month later, or you're going to show up and just interview and bench. So there's a lot of moving pieces that go into like an effective combine prep just outside of the physical preparation. Like, Were you there when the guy's dick fell out? <laughs> I, was, I was not. I was not there oh, when the man. guy's dick fell out. That was a big question I was ready to ask you today. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to let you down. Did you see the video? Did you see that monster fucking thing? <laughs> Good for him. Good for him. He's doing well. He's, do he's doing well. Very well. Yeah. How does somebody uh, increase their 225 bench? I know it's a weird test and probably not very relevant to much of anything in the world, but yeah. how I, would someone get that? Uh, get your reps up? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's technique. And it's funny because that's where... Are you pulling up the video? <laughs> Good for him. We're, we're going to relive this. This is like the two girls... Because you, one, weren't, because you oh, weren't there. This is the two girls Plus. one cup video. What did he run it in? I, no one knows what he actually ran it in. He, five, five flat. Well, he has to tuck it yeah, that's, in. That's nuts. Good for him. It it's is a nuts. lot of nuts. Yeah. Imagine just like running your dick out. Like, fuck. I've never done that in my life. You run? Is that around you? That has never happened. Look again. at the slow Get motion. Pause, though. Andrew. <laughs> there was another and guy. There was a guy. A few, <laughs> Too slow. Sorry. There was a guy that played for the, so um, the fucking. <laughs> uh, I think it was. Uh, I think it might have been like Vernon Davis. I think was he a tight end for the 49ers, the Niners, right? Yeah. He got tackled by his dick. <laughs> I don't remember that. You gotta have like a pretty big handle, like to, you know what I mean. Like someone's like, this is a great place to drag someone down by. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah I he do got remember. tackled yeah. by his dick. <sighs> the old dick tackle. <laughs> that God damn, unconventional. I, I was going through the grocery store the other day. And it's, it's like, uh, well, I forget what the original. Two twenty five. How do we get there? Oh, but a lot of times you said just technique. technique. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny coming from somewhat of a you know not a, a great powerlifting background, but one enough to bring to a football combine prep. And it's like, mm -hmm. look, if you can teach them how to transfer force in their legs, like how to not just throw themselves out of position every single rep. Like some of these guys are so erratic and explosive. that it's like, if you can put that on a track, you can squeeze out like four to six extra reps just on a first initial attempt, right? If, we're, if you're doing baseline numbers, you can literally just do an A-B test of like, okay, now don't do it stupid and do it like a bench press. I want you to bench press like a power lifter. I want you to sprint like a sprinter. I don't want you to sprint like a football player. I don't want you to sprint or I, want, I don't want you to bench like a football player. For these next, you know, whatever, six to eight weeks, like I want you to be benching like a power lifter. So setting up based off of their, their size and shape, a good technique that would really be emblematic of what you might see in a similar, you know, weight and height mm. distribution at a powerlifting meet. So they're just way more efficient with the power that they have. That makes them, you know, it just takes that strength and carries it way further because they're so erratic and in some ways been powerlifting sense inefficient with their position. So that's the number one thing we focus on day one. Is we take the bigs, we take the skills, we kind of split them up because the sizes and shapes are more similar in those two separate buckets. And we go, okay, bigs are going to bench like this and skills are going to bench like this. And then it's just like dialing in technique and just consistency. And, you know, fuck how many different people have you or programmed bench press for? Right. Some guys at 225 goes up if their max goes from 400 to 500 and then 225 is way easier. Some guys, you know, they don't recover well. They have injuries and you need to do a lot of sub max work and you need to do higher volume through increased frequency. So it's really kind of, you know, you're trying to hit 51%. You're trying to be the house, right? You just mm -hmm. want to always win that way. So you're not going to hit a perfect program, but if you can just make increasingly better decisions faster, then that's really like, that's the move in combat. Mm -hmm. Like every day you got to play the man. 
like programming goes out the window and coaching becomes like at the forefront. And that's just such a high stakes situation that like we were talking about before, it's like this different data that you're, uh, you're um, privy to when you're coaching every single day with these guys. And it's just, um, you gotta be, you gotta be receptive to that transmission every day. Mm. All right. Ready to answer some questions? Uh, sure. Depends. Yeah, <laughs> Depends not, on if it's... The, the first one starts off very general, very easy. It's from Gunpowder T, please. And then there's some there's some more specific questions later. But advice for those who struggle with fitness slash weight. And again, he only had a character limit there. So he said, best advice you have for those who struggle with fitness and weight management slash loss. Also, what is realistic time scale of how long it takes? Where's the specificity? For, for who, my friend? But... I feel like I'm I guess. the least equipped to answer that question. I would just give the most like back of the napkin, calories in, calories out. What's the research yeah. say? Like one and a half to two pounds a week. It's starting. Like I don't know. You probably have more insightful information on this. Can you uh, read the question again? Yeah. Bit? Okay. So I'll read it again. But I, again, it, it, it needs some detail because, all right, best advice you have for those who struggle with fitness and weight management slash loss. Also, what it take? What is the realistic time scale of how long it takes? It depends on how much weight you're trying to lose, mm -hmm. um, and also you probably shouldn't be. For some people, maybe it's good for them to have a time scale of how long they want to take to lose a certain amount of weight. But if you're getting into the game, I would say don't say I want to lose thirty pounds in three months. Don't don't give yourself a time limit because you need to build certain habits and certain skills, and it takes time to learn how to maybe understand how much food you're eating to get to sleep on time. All these habits take a bit of time. And if you're rushing yourself for the scale, then you're not taking the time to build the habits that's going to allow you to lose the weight for a long, or keep the weight off mm -hmm. for a long period of time. So that would be my answer to that question. But I would also say think? like uh, with, in terms of like uh, weight management and having it be something that's long lasting, I think it also kind of falls into a category of it would be probably pretty similar to the way that, that you might eat for performance. So like with a lot of your athletes, it might be similar suggestions where you're trying to make sure they're waking up at a similar time, going to bed at a similar time in whatever way they can, because they're the demand of uh, their job uh, might mess that up. And that would be the same thing with anybody else. Like just whatever way you can kind of manage your sleep would be a really good step. Um, trying to do like just some basic stuff, like uh, go on a walk, maybe a couple times a day, maybe increasing your steps, um, getting some sunlight. And then you start to kind of pick apart the food a little bit. Um, but if you're, if you have good choices in your food and you're getting good nutrition from your food, um, then it gets to be easier and easier to manage your body weight. One of the problems with, uh, becoming overweight is a lot of times you're deficient in nutrients. You are, you have extra amount of, uh, energy that you're consuming, but you're not really getting the nutrients from the foods that you probably need. Yeah. I mean, if I had to add to that, I would just say like, understand your incentive. Like Paul Quinn always had this thing that he would post. And I don't know if it was his quote, but it's like, uh, discipline doesn't exist. It's just a balance of things you love to do. Like if you love six pack, a uh, six pack abs more than cheesecake at a certain point, when you love that more, then that'll be like the, that the scales will tip in that direction, metaphorically and, and literally speaking. Say that bar one more time. Cause that was good. Well, which discipline one? isn't. Oh yeah. Discipline is just a, a, I don't know, a combination of, or a balance of things you love to do. Like if you, if you love the six pack abs or the idea of getting it more and you won't get them until that I, you love that idea more. So it's like, it's discipline. And it was, it was a polyquinism, whether it was his originally or not. Uh, that's where I first came across it. It's just a balance of things that you love. Mm -hmm. So it's like you, I think, especially if you're not dealing with the incentive of like dealing with an athlete where it's like, your next contract could be the difference between you needing a job and your great, 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 great grandkids never having to work. Right. So that's an usually enough incentive, but if you're, you know, you're not at the pro level, it's like, well, I would get really clear on your incentive and then that'll be what keeps you. And again, it's not motivation or discipline. It's whatever that desired outcome is. Cause a lot of people, when they start dying, it's like, well, why am I doing this? It's like, well, if you don't have a reason going into it, so you might want to establish that first on the little mood board before right. you enter into the endeavor. Because then if you're going to be moving in a direction that you've never moved before, trying to lose weight, inevitably you're going to run into that psychological block, right? Like I love the Stan Effortingism of like uh, compliance is the science. And it's like, well, yeah, if you, what are you compliant to and why? Uh, that would be like the only other thing that I would add from like a, like a psychological perspective where most people trip up is that. And if you're having a real hard time with the compliance is because you really don't want to do it. Yeah. Like ultimately, like if you really want to do it, you'll be doing it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny how that works. It's kind of annoying, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, and then also if it seems like if they're struggling, it's like they're starting and then they're stopping. And it's like, oh, this didn't work out. That didn't work out. Something that we always preach is like just the habits, right? Like just have the habits set in so much that they're no longer habits. It's just who you are. Like you are always the person that takes the stairs up, you know, up and you skip the elevator and that sort of thing. Because I think like, again, like the if you <laughs> lock in the habits, everything will seem to kind of like fall in its own place. And you don't have to worry about like, oh, this is a struggle. That's a struggle. It's like, no, I just, I'm that guy now. It kind of sick too, because other people will call you out on it too once they kind of recognize that that's what you do. Yeah. Then they'll be like, we're taking the stairs, right? And you're like, oh, yeah. fuck, they know that I don't have that. Accountability, yeah. <laughs> no, I got to take the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question from WJH. Question for Jordan and team. What would you say are your main differentiators compared to the rest of the fitness industry? What do people you work with commonly lack? Top three tips to implement today. Mm -hmm. So the first question, what do people you work with commonly lack and what makes you different in the, from other people in the industry? Uh, people I work with commonly lack, oh God, how specific do you want to be? Yeah. Uh, so I think one that might be applicable is like unilateral stability. I feel like stability, especially lower extremity. So mm -hmm. the ability to stand on one leg is massively underrated. And I think there's a huge push in the industry to quantify and objectify things where I think a lot of people who do this professionally really what you're looking for is qualitative, right? There's something that, there's things that I see that are subjective and in their interpretations that if I improve the quality and I set it to a standard of like, oh, that looks better. All of a sudden there's a correlation, a strong correlation, and we hope that it's causal of maybe fixing some of these underlying mechanisms. <clears throat> and then the objective that we monitor goes up. So what I mean by that is like, you know, we want to get someone faster. We want to get them to be able to change direction quicker. We're more agile. We want them to be able to jump higher, sprint faster, whatever. And if I don't establish qualitatively how they move, how efficiently they move, and that's what really separates good athletes is they move really, really efficiently. Mm -hmm. So we need to, or one of the things that I think most people across the board, pro athletes and non, they struggle at being able to subjectively interpret the quality of movement. And what a really easy test for this is like a single leg RDL. It's probably something I do more with any other client is can you stand on one leg and hinge? Because what I'm asking you to do is can you dissociate the position of your femur from the position of your pelvis, right? And then can you, res can you resist force while keeping your center of mass over your base of support? And that can give me like a ton of information. So most people, when I pose them with what should be a relatively simple task, are terrible at it, right? So they'll do a single leg RDL, but like their chest will face the opposite direction. It's like, well, so you're not actually dissociating your femur from your pelvis. You're just kind of moving everything in one plane. Because if you dissociated your femur from your pelvis, your leg would be on the ground and your pelvis would move around a fixed femur. So for me, it's like something I work on most with people. And it's only as a means to get towards the things that matter. But I'm only doing this as a as a brief introduction to some sort of you know a deadlift or a, a jump plyometric or something. It's you like, might have somebody do like something like an airplane or something like that. Yeah, but you're not doing it to like express more strength in an airplane. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to low uh, PR is airplane today. <laughs> yeah. But there's going to be the the objective PRs come off of the backs of subjective improvement. So a lot of people are worried. So like, oh, they're worried about programming. They're worried about percentage increases. It's like you're not even at the starting line yet. Right, you you can't quantify something until you qualified it first. Right, every day you come in, you're kind of doing a different movement. I compare it to like you take a guitar off a off a wall, and you know the first fret on a normal six string guitar would be an F note. The open E string is the first is is the open top string of the guitar, but the F is only an F on the first fret if the E is tuned to an E. Right, so if you don't have that that calibration like prior to training or as part of your training. All of a sudden, you're trying to you're trying to make all these adjustments on the fly, and it's like, well, you know, yeah, really good, really good athletes. They can like really good musicians. They can tune their guitar while they're playing a set, but most people aren't that. So it's like we want to make, make a concerted effort to actually teach you mm. how to tune your body to calibrate your body. You didn't and, tune anything up. You just skipped over the airplanes and went right into deadlift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't know what those underlying notes are, what those underlying strings are tuned to, right? Like, are can you control your pelvis? Can you control your hip? Can you control your spine? Um, and most people, and a really simple to make it actionable is like. Do a single leg RDL and see if you feel it in your hamstrings. See if you feel it in your glutes. You should feel it in your glutes. Mm -hmm. Anytime that you do a single leg movement, it's a glute exercise. By the proxy of you are minimizing your base of support, keeping your center of mass over that base of support, and you have to move side to side to do that. Hamstrings are not side to side muscles. 
their front to back muscles. So if you have, you know, you stand on this one leg and hinge and you feel it in your hamstring, you might be a little too stuck in the front to back and everything you do that's maybe side to side might be using your front to back muscles. Right? This is where we have a lot of issues in pro sports with hamstrings. This is why it's a test I use very often. It's like, hey, you carry your center of mass like way far forward when you're on one leg. Of course you do. You're really, really fast, right? You're probably very similar with your track background. You now with running, you're probably always in powerlifting, carrying your center of mass forward. It's like, if you can't control your center of mass, then you can't stay stable. Because what is stability is your ability to keep your center of mass over your base of support. So I think super actionable, just to recap, like single leg RDL, do you feel it in your hamstrings? No. Feel it in your glutes? Okay, if you can't feel it in your glutes, hold on to something so you're more stable, you have a broader base of support. And then if you still can't feel it, elevate your heel. That'll help shift your center of mass back. Then you should feel it in your glute. And now you're starting to get to, because and this is where it becomes more neurological and actual like this calibration idea uh, comes into play where I think stability really wins is... When you do that and you elevate your heel, you hold on to like a bench and you go into a single leg RDL and progress to an airplane. If you then take the heel elevation away, you'll immediately still be able to find it in your glute. So it wasn't the ankle. It wasn't the tight Achilles. It was just your body kind of trying to figure out where it is in space. Yeah. So that's my answer. I'm surprised that like with the number of pro athletes you work with, a lot of them have that same issue. It's like, it, it's just, it's interesting. I didn't, I wouldn't have expected that. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, <laughs> training physically like unique dissociation physical properties in the gym is just not a part of their sport that's true right so and that's what that's what weight training and strength and conditioning is like i remember being a kid and having this like this little car that i had and i would just like pull it back and it had like a little gear in it and then when i let it go it would just and i would sit there for hours and just like that was my entertainment I would pull <laughs> that's funny now because that's my job i take yeah. people off the field and i don't need to do all of the things they do on the field they have the field They've been playing football since they were six years old. Mm. So what I need to do is like, okay, what are the specific physical properties that they need to work on that underload the tissues that they're constantly overloading, but not just by taking those tissues and training them lighter, but by giving them variability of movement to train other tissues to give them more options when they're on the field. And what you'll see is as you do this, they'll start to move differently on the field. So if you can give them skills that sort of really exploit their inefficiencies in the gym and then you make them more efficient all of a sudden they're not they're recovering better in the season because when they move they have other options on the field so you leave this like neurological trail of breadcrumbs for them to follow by building endurance intensity uh velocity rhythm coordination and timing in these specific positions that they didn't have access to before then you watch them play and now all of a sudden it's like well you know their knees don't hurt so much because they can load into their hips in times where it was appropriate, where before they didn't have that option, right? So it's, it's sports are not balanced, right? Sports are, sports are task oriented and it has nothing to do with the physical system. So it's about peeling back, seeing where they're inefficient. And a lot of times it's, it's in the lower extremity, especially with football being such a lower body dominant sport. You probably get some good buy-in too, because they're probably like not used to like sucking at something, yeah. right? Yeah. And like most other things, if you test them, they'll probably do great on them. You have them do box jumps and you have them do all these different things. They'll probably do really well. Uh, and then you find something where they struggle with it and they're like, man, why do I suck at this? Yeah. And I mean, the best, <clears throat> what defines an athlete, in my opinion, is someone who can learn motor skills very quickly, right? Like we talked a little bit off, off camera about like really good athletes are like savants. And what is like, if you guys know the story of Kim Peek, it's always an analogy I use, the original Rain Man. So the director of Rain Man met this guy, the real guy, not Dustin Hoffman, but the guy they based the character off of. And the, what he could do is he could read the left side of a book with his left eye and the right side of his book, right side of a book with his right eye, and he read both pages in under three seconds with ninety eight percent recollection. Holy shit. Yeah. So like, but he's a similarly he was considered a mega savant, like one of the first documented cases of what a mega savant was. And mm. it's like, well, when you're watching the motor output and you're we're measuring forty times. Right, or we're, we're measuring vertical jumps or we're measuring bench press, a lot of times, and maybe bench press is not so much a, a, a representation of this, what you are watching is, is an oversensitive nervous system. Right, We see like the brute force motor output, but that's actually a, a, a byproduct of a highly tuned, highly sensitive sensory input component, which also starts with the muscle. Mm. Right, So athletes are sensory motor savants. They are sixth sense savants is what they are like the really good ones. And we see it through the objective lens of <clears throat> bigger, faster, stronger. But we, you know, what we're actually seeing under the hood is a hypersensory muscular system. And muscles are, are 
they're our second most predominant sensory organ in the body other than our eyes, but they're the most prolific by volume and surface area. Mm. All right. It's interesting, like when it comes to brain power, how things like that can happen, you know, where I don't really think there's examples. I mean, there's athletes that blow other athletes away that are like unbelievable, but you don't really see that physically as much as you do with like the mental capacity that someone can have in some people that are like savants and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just, and it just comes down to efficiency. There's no noise. It's all signal, right? There are athletes who, when you ask them to do some of these tasks that are low-level thinking tasks and like low-level integration of sensory and muscle, like for example, I won't name his name, but there's, I would say, the best active NHL player right now. When you get him to run, in a, in a, and I've, I've had friends who have worked with him, who have seen it, when you get him to run in a straight line for 20 yards, Take the top 20 guys in the league. Now, mind you, he is the fastest. Well, this might give it away. He's the fastest guy on skates right now. And you get him to run in a straight line for 20 yards. Uh, he's, I don't know, he's not even top 10. But if at the 10-yard mark you're standing there and you have to signal left or right, he's first and it's not even close. Cool. Like it's not even close. So some of the tasks in the gym are too low sensory input. Mm. right? And it's tough because, you know, we see the gym – in uh, from maybe from a general population sensor, not through the, the the sensory lens of these higher level athletes. And it can be hard to understand what game they're playing. Like a lot of times when, you know, mere mortals step in the gym. I don't know if you two are like really good examples of mere mortals. Mm -hmm. So when mere, sorry, dog, it's you, homie. <laughs> when mere mortals step into the gym, it's the gym is a, the gym is a, a, a it's a checkers board. Mm. But when they step into the gym, it's a chess board. The only thing that changes is the piece, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like they are they are playing that for they are playing that dimensional game that you can't really have access to if you don't have access to their software. And it's not their hardware. Their hardware is a manifestation of their software. Like they are, it is the sensory component that drives the motor output. And these people are so hypersensory that that's why what we watch the motor output, what we admire in sports, the the jumping and the running and the twisting and the dunking and all that. None of that would be possible if it wasn't for what was actually happening on the background, which is like a highly tuned sensory system, which actually occurs at the level of the muscle. All right. Next question from Hayden Pratt. And by the way, guys, at the end of this, we're going to be giving away a free pair of shoes from two P free pairs of shoes from Vivo, a gift card to Good Life Proteins, and uh, some good dick work from joy mode so if you want a harder dick we'll give you some joy mode at the end of the podcast if, if a girl oh, yeah, wins yeah. Yep. then uh we'll, we'll we'll switch that gift up unless i mean shit you may have something you want to give it to um Haley, hayden pratt asks tips for improving ankle slash foot mobility mm, okay this is not gonna be a really popular answer but un unless you've had serious injury at the foot and ankle a lot of times the ankle mobility is a bit of a myth because it comes down to the concept we talked about earlier about center of mass. One, you have to be able to put your foot in a position where the bones can actually move. So if you are someone who like hyper supinates or emphasizes supination of the foot, which could be a byproduct of external rotation of the hips, drive your knees out. Well, if you drive your knees out, you externally rotate your femurs, you externally rotate your tibias and you begin to externally rotate your feet, which is what supination is. You actually take the largest muscle or largest bone at the ankle, the talus bone, and you put it in the way of the tibia as it needs to go forward. Your tibia needs to internally rotate to actually go over the, over the toe, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so one, are you in the right position, right? You can do all the ankle mobility drills in the world, but if your talus if your foot is still on this like super high arch and you're not actually applying whole foot pressure into the ground, when I flatten, pronate, or internally rotate my feet or my talus, my ankle, my that bone moves out of the way and my tibia can now internally rotate as I move forward, right? So that's usually one of the issues. Issue number one is like you're not in the right position to actually express that range of motion, right? Like if I tried to, I don't know, do like a super hingy squat and I get a pinching in the front of my hip, it's like, well, yeah, I'm taking a, an acetabulum, I'm dumping it forward and I'm taking a femur and jamming it into that, that shelf, right? So like, oh, I feel pain in my back and I feel pinching in the front of my hip and my, my, my depth sucks. It's like, well, no, your pelvis is just in the wrong position. It's the same thing a lot of times with ankle mobility. It's like what you're dealing with is just you're dealing with bones that are staying in the way. Now, secondary, secondary to that is how you carry your center of mass. A lot of people, oh, my hamstrings are too tight to squat to depth or mm -hmm. my calves are too tight and that's what's stopping me. It's like, well, you're just chronically carrying your center of mass forward. I always think of like, you guys ever see Squid Games? 
Yeah. So like when Squid Games got real in that one episode, Red Light, Green Light, uh, and they're just like, oh, I don't know, this is kind of like a weird Korean, bah, 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 and they just started like <laughs> mowing everyone down. Yeah. And there was that one really dramatic scene where like the guy like holds the other dude up as he's about to fall. If he drops him, he's getting fucking lit up. That's most people's nervous system is the guy behind you, right? We see people walking upright and we just think, hmm, their, their experience in walking upright must be the same as, as mine as someone who like trains and has control over center, especially you, because you compete in a sport where not only you have to control your center of mass, but you have to control the center of mass of others. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, when we talked off air, you're like, I really like jujitsu because I was getting beat up by guys hundred pounds lighter than me. The mistake that people in jiu-jitsu make that are sort of unaware of the terminology, and my friends who who roll, they say this to me, they're like, oh, I can use your strength against you. It's like, bitch, I'll punch a hole in your face. Like, you're not going <laughs> to use my strength against me. Like, But like, they can absolutely fuck me up. But what they mean is they can use my center of mass against me. Well, the only reason they can do that is because they can control theirs first. It's a prerequisite to controlling someone else's, right? So when we deal with like tight hamstrings and tight calves and tight Achilles, tight low backs and tight glutes, that's literally your nervous system activating all of these things because you're not in control of your center of mass. Your spine is just getting crushed to the earth and you're not aware of it. So when someone stands here upright who might have ankle mobility issues, it's as if their nervous system is taking their entire extensor chain and just turning it on because they want to succumb to the forces of gravity acting on them. And that's like we talked about the single leg RDL thing. That would be a really good place to start. It's like, can, can, you, can you feel your glute when you stand on one leg? Oh no, I can't. I said, like, well, how do you think you're getting around all day? You're not mm. pushing. You're just pulling with your hamstrings, right? You're not, you're just extending. You're not actually being able to use the glute to move, you know, through the frontal plane and be able to use that lateral stability of the hip. So yeah, a lot of times <clears throat> when we deal with ankle mobility issues, we're dealing with long standing inabilities to control your center of mass, especially on one leg, which is more difficult because you're less stable because you have a smaller base of support. Gotcha. So everyone should have a big ass. I, you know, that's a world I one day want to live. <laughs> <laughs> Could be detrimental though. Like, can't you make your ass too big? I don't know. Have you been to Brazil? I've never been, but it looks nice. Mm. Well, there you <laughs> go. Wouldn't you want Davis to be Brazil? I would. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, we just lost Andrew for a moment. Well, just, I'm just, you know, you have a wife. And then also thinking about how much trouble that that would be <laughs> and how grateful I am that well, I'm Well, luckily the podcast has a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> product just, placement moment yeah Jordan, enjoy I have, mode yeah I have, a, I have a question for you real quick um, when it comes to things like the single leg RDL or just typical squats um, something that I've seen like some people when they're squatting they don't really use their feet much so what mm -hmm. ends up happening is like they'll just squat down and then their feet will kind of like their big toe and their feet will kind of come off the ground a little bit um, but one thing that tends to help some people with that is the idea of just kind of rooting the foot into the ground when they're squatting. So is that something that you think could help people with that, that understanding how to like kind of root that foot? It causes the hip to externally rotate a little bit. What do you think about that? Mm, I think it's usually a pelvis. You got to be careful with rooting the feet because that if that's external rotation, then you're mm -hmm. moving the talus in front of the tibia again. Okay. Right? Like here, oh, literally do this. The tongue of my shoe. Can they see this? Yeah. Great. Okay. So Perfect. we have, can I still see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we have a shin bone. We have a talus. Mm -hmm. Say this is the talus. Most people, when you externally rotate, if I turn that this, I'm going to supinate, which means like my arch is high. Mm -hmm. When my arch is high, my talus stays in front of my tibia. So I can't move my shin forward because this bone is in the way. But when I, pronate the foot and I have whole foot pressure, which means like first metatarsal head. So, and this is really important. And you see what that big bullseye is? Nike knows what the fuck they're doing, right? <laughs> first metatarsal head, fifth metatarsal head, arch and heel. That's whole foot pressure, right? A lot of people cue the big toe. That's maybe a little bit misguided in application when you work with people in real life. What happens is when they push down on the big toe, like here, that actually creates that supination. Again, they're trying to get pressure here. How do they do that? They whoop. They pop that up. Now it's like, well, now your talus is in the way again, right? So when I think whole foot pressure, it's like, all right, so we want to we want to pronate, so bring this down because this slides out of the way and then the tibia can go forward. And we've unlocked gotcha. ankle mobility by improving position. When you root the foot by externally rotating, you're externally rotating the femur, you're externally rotating the tibia, and you're externally rotating the foot, 
a lot of times what happens is the foot doesn't move because the pelvis is in the wrong position. We don't have control of the pelvis. The pelvis dumps forward. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of just pointing our femur or our, our hip sockets towards the ground to apply force. A lot of people you see with not a lot of like dexterity in the feet when they squat, when they get to the bottom, their feet just turn out. Mm -hmm. That's because they're trying to like internal rotation is force production. External rotation is force absorption, right? So if I go to throw a punch, I'm going to internal rotate my shoulder all day. I'm not going to try and like do some fighting Irish shit. Like this is not going to, this is not a good That'd strategy. Be a good uh, Steven Seagal move. Do you he could pull it off though. And then teach some like foreign <laughs> government how to, like, <laughs> how to fight. This is how your police force fights now. He's an amazing character. Uh, incredible. But internal rotation is force production. So it's like your body is trying to find internal rotation everywhere going into the ground. Mm -hmm. If you're setting the trajectory by anteriorly tilting your pelvis, your femurs are rotating out, your tibias are rotating out, and your ankles end up rotating out as a byproduct of that. If we can get our pelvis underneath us, we can open up the space for us to internally rotate, and those feet can actually get exposed to some stimulus. Where right now, they're kind of, when you see these kind of like dead feet paddles that just sort of like <laughs> penguin off to the side, it's like, well, it's just because the, I have a friend of mine, Killian Hamilton, he makes this comparison to uh, the, the, the foot is the TV, but the hip is the antenna. So some of you might be too young to remember mm -hmm. like having an antenna TV, but like I would walk through the kitchen or walk through the, the living room with a TV dinner and the metal on the plate would, have, and my dad would be like, don't move. And I was like, what? And I just have to stand there. And he's like, guess he knew like if the signal went, he's not, he's not going to, you know, you don't hit the TV, yeah. you hit the kid, right? <laughs> and I was just like, and I, so I just sit there and like watch the wheel in the living room with a hungry man's dinner like the whole time because that like calibrated. So it's, it's the idea that when we look at the foot, a lot of times what we're seeing is that's just the signal and the hip is really the antenna. So I really like that analogy by Killian because I think it's, it's true when we mm -hmm. see issues and not to say that, you know, foot centric training modalities can't be useful. We talked about this before. The foot is incredibly hypersensory. And getting a lot of uh, variability in that sensory input can be useful. But I think, you know, you have to start by putting that foot in the right position. And that's where the pelvis comes into play. Gotcha. Maybe we can just squat high and not worry about it. Yeah, it'll be there on meat day. It always <laughs> is, right? Come on. For the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all Vivo barefoot shoes. And Seema, can you tell us why these shoes are so great? For years on this podcast, we've been talking about the benefit of barefoot shoes. And these are the shoes I used to use back in like 2017, 2018. My old Metcons, they are flat, but they're not very wide and they're very stiff and they don't move. That's why we've been partnering with and we've been using Vivo barefoot shoes. These are the Modus Strength shoe because... Not only are they wide, I have wide ass feet and so do we here on the podcast, especially as our feet have gotten stronger, but they're flexible. So when you're doing certain movements, like let's say you're doing jumping or you're doing split squats or you're doing movements where your toes need to flex and move, your feet are able to do that and perform in this shoe, allowing them to get stronger over time. And obviously they're flexible. So your foot's allowed to be a foot. And when you're doing all types of exercise, your feet will get stronger, improving your ability to move. Andrew, how can they get their hands on these? Yes, and for the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all of your Vivo Barefoot shoes. That is a limited time deal for the month of April only. So if you've been waiting for the perfect time to buy your Vivo Barefoot shoes, now is that time. Head over to vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject, enter the code for April, and receive 25% off your entire order. Link is in the description as well as the podcast show notes. All right. This is uh, actually, this is specifically for you, Jordan. Deadlifts and Feral Cats asks, is it possible to purchase the PSL1 textbook before registration? When will the next PSL1 course registration open and start? RX Radio is awesome. Wow. Big company, man. Look at that. What a layup off the backboard yeah. for the <laughs> quick slug. I got to show Joy Mode just because. Uh, <laughs> so answer no. The L1 manual comes with the L1 textbook. Uh, next semester will start March 27th, the registration will be open by the end of this month. If you go to prescript.com, you can click through the L1 uh, link and you'll get on the opt-in list, which uh, is the only discount we have. So if you want to get into the course for next semester, head over to the website, register, and just put your name down. You'll be the first to know, and it's the only discount we have. So and for that, those who don't know what Prescript is... Oh, right. Yeah. So I uh, founded a, a continuing education company in the health and fitness space eight years ago. Um 
that uh, is accredited for CEUs with NASM, NSCA, ACE. If you're a chiropractor and physical therapist, continuing education units, as well as SIMSPA in the UK. So we're accredited for continuing education units in 30 five countries Damn. across a few. Yeah. So that's uh, applied biomechanics, functional anatomy. So the course that, um, feral cats and deadlifts. I thought that was part of the question. I was like, yo dog, this is <laughs> like, <laughs> I looked over at you and I was like, what the fuck question is this? Um, yeah. So it's a continuing education that that course specifically is about applied biomechanics and functional anatomy. Wow. I like this feature. This is nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the L one tab up there on the top, right next to collective. If you took that, yeah, there you go. So that's kind of comes to the textbook in 96 hours of this shit looks lab. beautiful. Yeah, thanks, man. That's been uh it's been my baby for the last decade or so. So yeah, we have L1, L2, and we have a nutrition arm of the company. We have some programming courses. And specific- Somebody goes through uh your courses and they they get through all of them. <laughs> uh, what can they kind of expect? Like what what are what can they go into? Like what fields maybe? Yeah, so the level one uh, level two, level three. The level three is actually, and kind of to our point earlier, it's actually the reason we call it a coaching course is because level three, we actually bring our level two students out to Tampa, Florida to train our combine athletes and our pros. Cool. So we only take seven per intake of L3s and it's a week long of like, okay, you know, all the X's and O's. That's, uh, this guy's worth $150 million. Go. And it's, and it's wild. Like it's wild to see people who are on paper and, you know, we have interactive labs every day. So we really get to know like the students that come through the program, but then you have the opportunity to put them in front of, you know, number one in the draft or, you know, some guy that just signed a $300 million or a baseball player that's a contract that's worth $496 million. You're like, all right, dog. Hmm. let's see. And it's like, you train soccer moms for a living. Let's, let's see how little you've been actually paying attention. And mm-hmm. people are like, wow, like I thought, I thought I really like cared about my job. It's like you do now, but yeah, it's, it's fun. So that's, that's the big thing now. And it's not about like becoming a strength and conditioning coach. It's about like, can you operate at the highest level? And a lot of people are trying to advance their business. And like, we don't, you know, we're not business coaches or anything, but it's like, you can run a really good business if you understand how to be product first. And that's really what we just throw you into the fire. It's like, all right, we're here if you need us. We'll make sure you don't fuck up. But like, go talk to that guy. Oh yeah, he's fucking six, eight, four, ten. Good luck. Runs a five flat 40. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's that's where our market is primarily in personal training, but strength and conditioning. And we also see like a fair amount of clinicians in there as well. There was a dude at the combine that this year that was like six eight, like three forty or something like that, wasn't there? Uh, so the biggest guy, there's some uh, real mutant there. Yeah, this year. we we had uh, J C Latham. J C Latham was six six three sixty oh, from Alabama. Yeah, yeah just you just there's a there's a there's a place in America around like Florida, Georgia into yeah. Texas that Panhandle where like these guys. Or they're just absolute monsters, man. Like it's so cool. It's like literally you walk in and you feel like you're in Jurassic Park. Did you say six six three six? Yeah, I mean we had Christian. Christian Barmore works in the off season, and I, Yo Murphy, who's a really close friend of mine, he runs the program down there alongside. But we bring our guys in. Yo's like the best. He's trained Christian, and if I'm not mistaken, Christian at three sixty prepping for his here he plays for the Patriots. He ran a four nine one forty at six six three sixty. Holy yeah, shit, I don't know. Do the scary. physics on that. Like, that just sounds so dangerous. It's so <laughs> dangerous, man. I had I brought my videographer with me, and this is this is a really funny story. He doesn't he doesn't know football at all. And I brought him down when I went to work with a few of our baseball players. Um, and there's someone doing sled pushes on the turf. The, the gym is gorgeous. It's super long turf down the middle. Of the it's exactly what you want for training ball players. And my videographer's like kind of looking around. He's like, yeah, I don't know. He's doing what video people do, like oh the lighting or whatever. And he's not paying attention, and he almost gets run over by a guy oh. on the sled. In Donicum Sue. I was Holy like, oh man. Shit. I was like, that'd be the worst person to get run over by. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was like, because I look, I was like, oh, Jay Marsh, like, look out. And he's like, oh, fuck. And he like jumps out of the way. Like, I think in Donicum sped up. Like, I think he saw him. <laughs> it was just like, oh, like, dude, he's going to like, he's going to do some damage. Yeah, he definitely seems a little angry on the field, too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, he makes him good at his job. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. What a great question. Unbelievable. Yeah. I, gotta, I gotta throw that guy a bone. Yo, shoot me a message, dog. I appreciate the plug. Dead listen to feral cats. Message that's the man. actually don't message me until you change whatever that <laughs> handle is. That's nuts. All right. Next question from Haley Neal. Any recommendations of a peptide safe for females to use to cut body fat while weight training? We were barking up the wrong tree. Peptides for female use. 
I don't have experiment much experience with either of those, especially in weight loss. I've been nothing but steadily gaining weight since I got into <laughs> powerlifting. So I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I don't know if you guys have any experience with that. I don't. What about uh, peptides for injuries? Have you come across anything that yeah. seems to be effective for anything like that? Yeah, I've taken it. I mean, through a, a deal, you guys know, um, I've done a few self-administered back alley courses when I was in my powerlifting days and more uh, clinically supervised, let's say, recent ones. And yeah, I, I've taken uh, recently thymus and beta-4 and BPC-157. And I did an ultrasound guided injection into my right shoulder. A deal did that. And then I ran, it was unbelievable. Like next day, felt an immediate difference. Because there is like an acute local anti-inflammatory effect with these peptides. They, they increase angiogenesis. So they increase selective blood flow, which is like, this is the part where, I th and I even struggle with this, is there's always this question of like, how do they know? Like, how do they know where to go? And everyone's like, oh, I don't know. And it's like, okay, like I'm going to do it because I'm reckless with drugs. But like, I can see where the apprehension would right. be of like this, what do you mean it just knows, right? Because there's always a question of like contraindications. Like if something, angiogenesis is like a big fancy medical word uh, that a deal taught me because he's a real doctor uh, about like increasing blood flow. And it's like, well, that sounds bad for someone who like has cancer or maybe has like a history of strokes or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they're like, yeah, there's actually no contraindications because they're biomodulators, right? If something is up, it'll bring it down and something is down, they'll bring it up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, so there is always like that weird question in my brain of like, how, like how smart, like how is this thing so smart? I don't even know where it should go. But the nice, the nice, the, the neat thing about peptides, I should say is they act at the level of the DNA. So long-term exposures are more beneficial. And we kind of know this, right? We know this from the meathead uh, pharmacology because peptides is just a classification of a type of hormone. Right, like where most of us are used to, like you know, AAS, like androgenic anabolic steroids. Peptides are you know a different composition; they're a little bit more complex. Most of the time, they can't be adjusted orally, so they're usually like subcutaneous injections. But they their change, like common peptides that most people know about, are insulin and human growth hormone. If you were to go to a bodybuilder and say, "I'm going to run HGH for a week," they would probably laugh at you. They're like, you need to take this for at least six months or a year and whatever that bro science is. And when we talk about recovery peptides and I'd be, you know, I, I work with a deal alongside co-managing athletes and return to play after surgeries and injuries and things like that. But long-term exposure to peptides, peptides work at the level of DNA. So you're actually going to get that gene expression over time if you run that course of peptides for longer. So I think Regardless, if you're going to go into and obviously like where you source it matters and how you dose it matters, especially with some that are growth hormone fragments that could affect your blood glucose levels both acutely and long term. Long term exposure at lower doses, from what I could gather, seems to be potentially beneficial because you're making those changes at the level of the DNA and and as those cells replicate over time rather than just acutely like I'm just going to do a course of peptide which is like I competed at the Arnold's in Australia and then the US Open three weeks later because like someone tore something and then Gracie V was like I don't know I don't know who you are but someone said you should go and it's like okay and then it was a meet where Herbie tore his elbow apart. Oh, shit. Larry took a knee with 800 and Kevin Oak. And I was just like, I think I got like fourth that meet just because like, I didn't die. <laughs> like, yeah, that's amazing. No. But my elbow was fucked coming off the Australia. They were same day way. And so I got, anyway, anyway, so I ran a course like directly into my elbow for my tricep tendon and it held on, but it was, it was kind of a dumb way to do it. In my opinion now, it's like, oh, wow, like how much of that was placebo? How much was that maybe just local anti-inflammatory effect? But like, I wasn't getting any of the benefits of the long-term genetic expression because I had no idea that at then that it replicated at the level of DNA. I've heard of dumber things for sure. God love powerlifting. You're <laughs> setting such a low bar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't really uh, have any advice uh, necessarily um, because I don't really know. Like, you know, safety of stuff, it, it does seem like peptides. It doesn't seem like they're harmful, but... To be able to like, you know, blatantly say that and to have any idea of the long-term implications of what some of these peptides can do, I got no idea. Yeah. Any really safety weird. precautions with peptides? I just, yeah, none that I've been uh, professionally been warned of as a male. I would say the one thing you got to worry about is some of the peptides, like insulin is a peptide by designation. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Do not run. And there are some that acutely affect like CJC and ipamorelin, if I'm not mistaken. 
But when it comes to weight loss, I think a lot of times that conversation, especially around the females, ends up with like a, that ends up sliding into SARMs. So know the difference between the two because a lot of people are like, oh, it's a peptide, it's safe. And they go, are peptides safe? And they say yes. But what they end up taking is actually a SARM, which mm. is not safe and really dumb. And you could run into a ton of issues there. So what I've seen with like the biomodulation effect and who I've talked to, like uh, John Francois Tremblay, who is like the guy. He like uh, makes peptides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, can can right? labs, yeah. And then uh, Dr. William Seeds is another guy who runs like the peptides sound foundation. He was the one who treated Tom Brady's hand when it got cut uh, in the Super Bowl. And they had a therapeutic use exemption for that. It seems as if the majority of like the gray market ones that are getting used really operate as biomodulators. If something is up, it's not going to make it more up. Where like if, you know, drugs most of the time force their action. LSD, for example, right? Like if you take LSD, it's like, you're not going to be okay for like yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Whereas there's no modulation there. Like you're just, every the saturation is going to be turned up for like a few hours. And maybe. if you mess up the dosage on that, you know, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. And again, with peptides, again, I'm not going to say that you can't mess up the dosage, but from my own personal experience and the experience I've heard from other people's, they seem pretty damn safe. Yeah, yeah. And again, how do they know? <laughs> yeah, That's crazy. Know. What about uh, melanotan? Like, how does that work? Because I'm just wondering that if your skin complexion gets darker, then you can maybe intake the sun better, and then maybe that might help. That's with what weight it's loss? for, right? Uh, uh, well, I don't know if it would work that way because um, it. You know, there's like a yin and yang to everything. So there, I think on that front, like you might potentially be like lowering your vitamin D and things like that. Mm -hmm. But if you took small amounts of it, maybe mm -hmm. um, it's supposed to help make you more resilient to the sun. It's supposed, supposed to be anti-cancer. But again, it's like, it's all just like very speculative, you know. You're trying to get Graham to stop questioning your Latin American heritage. <laughs> yeah, that was weird, huh? He was really pressing me. <laughs> I was like, look, bro, like, I, I don't know. I can show well, you my parents' birth certificate. Like, he, was, I think he, wanted, he was waiting for like a stomach tattoo. I thought he was going to bring out like a fucking yeah. almanac or something. <laughs> yeah. Dude, when I was at yeah, his place, he was like surprised that I was swatting flies away because he thought I should be used to it. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it happens. I made it feel that, uncomfortable that for took, it too. I'm like, well, it also like, took me a from second. Africa. Why, why? Like, I was like, Graham, just because I'm from Africa doesn't mean Wait, I that like actually flies. happened? <laughs> you know, Get the fuck out of here. I thought you were just, per oh my God. Dude, what is wrong with Graham? <laughs> it's just funny. And it was purely innocent. This is the, I know Graham, so it was innocent. But it was like, just because I'm African doesn't mean I'm used to flies flying need, like, around my head. I stuff them in someone's <laughs> trunk someday or something, you know? <laughs> That's what you get for having diversity on your shit. Yeah, <laughs> the problem. What are you, what are you thinking? I don't know. Jeez. Yeah, how can all these people get along? They can't. <laughs> it's got a regular United Nations going on here. It's just here. a fucking Stanford experiment all over again. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're both the guards and the prisoners. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a quickie from Valerie Page for you, Mark. Bots mistake, shake. Way excited. For Mark, do you like listening to anything when you run? What earbuds or headphones do you use when running? I like listening to a lot of podcasts. Sometimes I'll listen to some music. Um, I don't know what the headphones I have are. You have those Apple AirPod Maxes. Yeah, I, I uh, use those a lot. Um, but I switched because I just was like worried about microwaving my head too much. <laughs> yeah, they have so, those like weights on them or something. Yeah, right? I have I have head like a headset like this, like with a wire. But mm -hmm. if you want to try to be more cautious and you're worried about like the EMF stuff, you can just use the um, any of the headphones that come that attach to your phone that are hooked in. Wired. So Jack Cruz got that. to you, huh? Oh. A little bit, a little bit. Is that yeah. why more people are wearing them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No yeah, shit. That's why you're seeing more people with the wires, yeah. Really? Well, you were talking about your TV, you know, and, and the reception and like your, yeah. your, I mean, it's like, are some of these waves, you know, potentially coming through us? Like, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of satellites. There's a lot of shit uh, flying everywhere. So maybe if you can take some precaution against it, maybe it'll help a little bit. I don't know. I'm here for it. <laughs> it doesn't right. make it any, doesn't make it any harder for me to run or anything. So it's just like, you know, the wire flops around a little bit, but not a huge deal. But I don't know what brand it is. Mm. Yeah. It's cool. just, I, I got it on, on uh, Amazon. They were like 160 bucks or something like that. Okay. It worked pretty good. All right. This isn't this next one is a super chat from Tanner Spaulding. Thank you. But it's not a question. He said, no question, just a shout out. I am down over 100 pounds since March 2023. Wow. Congratulations, brother. Thank you to Mark and Sima and Andrew for all the great free advice. Though through the podcast, you were instrumental in my success. You're welcome, homie. A lot of weight. That's pounds. fucking That's a lot of good weight. Good job. In a mm -hmm. year. Damn. In a year. Okay, cool. Next question. Huh. Jeremy Avila. Hey. Stop hey. Fuck. Now the question oh just God. like went away. Oh, no. It disappeared. No. Now it's back. It's back. It's Wait, no, it's not back. Oh, God. 
Where the fuck? Did I got a question. How Here much we, uh, did you weigh when you started powerlifting, and how long have you been powerlifting for? Mm, I started powerlifting. My first meet was in Santa Cruz in 2015. My last meet I did was in 2021. 2020 is that right? It's like six, seven years was like actively competing, and then COVID kind of like shut things down. Yeah, I maintained around the same weight. I, I once jumped up to the 275 class for boss of bosses four. Or something like that. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was about 260 when I started, cut down to 242 for my first meet. And then I was consistently around 260, 265. Uh, when I competed at 275, I got as high as 293. And then I got Damn. down to 260, 265. Mm. And that's kind of where I walk around now, just not nearly as muscular or strong <laughs> as I was when I was actively competing. But any particulars to the diet or just having some fun and eating like protein and then just kind of like, eating whatever. Oh, when I got super heavy, it was, I mean, you know, it's like, it's so hard at a certain <laughs> point, especially when you're training a decent amount. Um, but no, I, yeah, protein and protein and overall calories is really my main focus and kind of continues mm -hmm. to be that. I think that's a really good dietary strategy for most people who are super busy to follow. And I think what we're seeing now, which is really good. And it's one of like the things I think most beneficial coming out of the longevity space mm -hmm in the podcast world and books and all that is that people are getting more comfortable with the more grams per kilogram of body weight protein intake. So mm -hmm. I think if you set, you know, a, a, a higher ceiling than you might be comfortable with the mom science you were fed growing up and your kidneys are going to blast out of your body or whatever. <laughs> uh, if you set a high threshold of your protein intake daily to the point where it's like, it's somewhat of an arduous task and you set a calorie limit that's near and around what a maintenance would look like and you're relatively active like i think it's really easy it's much easier now to maintain under those few constraints it's like, okay your goal number one is like how am i going to get you know 269 probably a little over 300 grams of protein a day which is obviously more than a gram per pound of body weight um, and then if my calories come in somewhere around 3700 how that 3700 gets made up between carbs and fats and especially i'm a little bit selective about how i eat when i train if those constraints kind of leave me in a pretty easy place to put together like a nutritional strategy every single day. I travel a shit ton. So it's like, okay, wake up. And the first thing I think about when my feet hit the floor is like protein intake. Oh, yes. I thought you were going to talk about Ben and Jerry's. Oh, yeah. No, like, Damn. no. I, I, I wish. And that was the 293 strategy. <laughs> it was like, all right, how much protein and then how much Ben and Jerry's? Or like, <laughs> would I recall? Because I would how lose. Much and, how much can you get in? There? I would lose 20. I remember my first, this is a Dan Green story. Uh, my first meet I did was some this, uh, Surf City Classic in Santa Cruz. And like my training partners were Dan Green and Andrew Herbert. Jesus Christ. And I didn't know powerlifting outside of that. Like Dan, I met just mm. through, like he was a patient of mine. You're like everyone squats 900 pounds. Oh, I thought I was going to get a obliterated and i was like worried and i go to weigh-ins and he texts me i'll never forget and i was i don't know i was like 120 like a couple weeks before and i cut down like 109 to make the weight cut and he's like Kilos, hey, right yeah yeah, yeah sorry <laughs> sorry and he's like what'd you weigh in at i was like 109 and he goes i want you to weigh one i want you at 116 in the morning and i was like i'm like is it possible to get diabetes overnight <laughs> And he goes, if you tr if you care enough, it is. And I was like, that's a typical dad answer. So the recomps were the worst for me. I was just like, anything goes. I would get like, ice cream was the first thing I would get. I would go to Whole Foods wherever, and whether it was Jesse's Meats, I did Record Breakers a few times. And I would just go like, okay, done weigh-ins. And I would get like everything I could. And then I would, my, my brain went like, okay, and I can always fill in the gaps of what space is left in my stomach with ice cream. It can just morph and help <laughs> fill in. So yeah, ice cream was a big part of it. Mm. All right. Next question. When hitting a wall, this is from Nate Gates, when hitting a wall with progression, would it be more beneficial to regress or switch up programming altogether? Mm. Okay. Uh, so I like the idea of deliberate variability, not novelty. And I think that's a key, that's that's a key underlying component to if when you understand mechanisms of exercise you can be deliberately variable with your exercise selection. And really exercise selection is our number one tool in managing load. So if you're not progressing, one of two things is likely happening. You're under or overloading, right? You're overloading and under recovering, or you're chronically underloading and you're not actually providing enough stimulus to get stronger. So mo what most people do is they keep the core exercises and then they adjust their volume and intensity. It's like the best way to adjust intensity is to adjust the exercise selection. Because if I'm doing a goblet squat, 
the constraint of that exercise is, I don't know, like 150 pounds I could probably do here. But it's, that's a fucking struggle. The yeah. set of the collateral in the rest of my work of just getting the thing into position is like, oh, this is a nightmare. The move of going from progressing to goblet squat to front squat, 150 front squat, it could be my warm up set from walking and cold off the gym. So like I've immediately scaled load ability and by just removing that constraint. So I think, you know, the idea of switch up programming, it's like, well, yes, or progress or regress. Those are the same thing, right? So you got to understand like, well, you know, are you one, are you over, are you under stimulating or are you under recovering, right? So if you think you're going more to one side, under stimulating, it's like maybe you pick more exercises that are higher stimulus, higher load, right? You don't try and load the exercises, you're doing more. Because there's a there's a there's an underlying issue with the loadability of the current constraints, the exercise you're picking in your program, or vice versa, right? Some people, some people are like, oh, you know, maybe they're under recovering, which means, yeah, I saw a program I was working with this athlete the other day, and like, they had there was four lower body sessions a week, and one of them alone had like leg press, hack squat, and pendulum squat on the same session. I was like, this person does not like you. Like whoever is programming for you, yeah. like they do not want you to be okay. <laughs> and I was like, those should be like sentinel exercises in one training day a week and then disperse those out across three, not all three in one, plus having compounds in other, in other uh, training days. So it was like immediately her progression was, we need to start constraining these exercises. Mm -hmm. right? I'm going to get rid of that and make that uh, make that a dumbbell variation. Like, oh, you're doing Bulgarians on a, on a Smith machine. I want you to do that with a dumbbell in the opposite hand of the foot that's forward. Immediate constraint. Now, the constraint is also promoting variability, deliberate variability. I'm giving her more frontal plane movement of the pelvis. She can move around. Her rib cage can start to rotate more. She starts to underload the tissues that she's chronically overloading and start introducing some, not novelty, but deliberate variability. I'm specifically doing this for the sub adaptations that occur with exercise. So a lot of people just go, oh, I'm going to mix it up. I want to hit it from all angles, incline, decline, flat press, fly press. And it's like, that's just not, where do you go when you run out of, when you run out of runway, right? So it's like with deliberate variability, it's like, what is your program missing? Mechanistically, what is it missing? And we start shooting there. The load management starts to sort itself out. Yeah, and you think about like what's what's the huge benefit of squats and deadlifts? It's just that you can handle a lot of weight on them. Yeah. Uh, what makes barbell movements amazing is the fact that you can handle a lot of weight. What makes them detrimental is the fact that you can handle a lot of weight. So you want to try to, you know, prescribe it appropriately to where you are in your own uh, like training, I guess, years. Right? Yeah. Training uh, like lifestyle. Yeah. Or lifetime, I should say. There's a ton of information online about how to start a podcast, how to grow a podcast, how to monetize a podcast, but how do you know what actually works? And also, how do you know what step comes now and what step comes later? I went through years of trial and error figuring this stuff out so that way you don't have to waste any time. You get just the answers. Introducing Full-Time Podcaster, the online podcasting course that will teach you everything about podcasting at PursuePodcasting.com. This course will teach you how to launch a podcast in as little as 30 days, and it will show you the path on how to build a very successful podcast like Mark Bell's Power Project Podcast. Everything I've learned from over a thousand episodes, over 80 million views and downloads is in this course. Head over to PursuePodcasting.com, check the links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes, and just pursue it. All right. Now, next question from Jay Tubes is actually a super chat. 10 bucks. Thank you. Um, I want to progress in my specific sport, jujitsu, but also progress in my aesthetic and athletic goals. Is it possible to balance and progress in all goals or is it better to prioritize one over the other? Is this your question? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it I sounds think like it's him. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, so. How would you do? Uh, I don't know. I would ask you the same thing, the same thing this guy did. I think it's like, it, it depends right. on what the individual is trying to do. Like you work with a lot of athletes, obviously they're specific to their sports, but if you're trying to get better at jujitsu and you want to get better at other things, you could go the route of, um, having, obviously having your sport focus. So jujitsu, maybe you're doing that four or five sessions a week, but then you have, you know, whatever you do in the gym, maybe two days a week, but it's not something that's overtaking anything else. And then whatever your aesthetic goals are, maybe you're handling your diet. But for me personally, what I like to do is I like to microdose things. So I have something like swimming, sprinting. Um, there's some kettlebell stuff I do in the gym, but I do these things 15 to 20 minutes a day. 
they don't take too much out of me, but I can still have my four or five sessions of jujitsu a week and progress at that hard. Now, if I was someone who was really wanting to progress in the gym, progress at strength, et cetera, and I was trying to do jujitsu at the same time, potentially I would lower my frequency of jujitsu so I can still get some good training in each week, maybe two to three sessions. And then in the gym, I would maybe increase my frequency of what I'm doing in the gym. Maybe I'd have three or four good training sessions in the gym. But that just depends on what you're trying to do. So think about what is your priority at this moment in time? Is your priority, I want to get as good as jujitsu as, as possible? Then if that's the case, spend most of your time doing the stuff in the sport with higher frequency, four or five days, but you can still progress at these other things two to three days a week. If you want to spread yourself out a little bit, just understand that if you're doing three sessions of jujitsu, three sessions of lifting, and then some other athletic stuff, you will progress at all of these things consistently over time, but it will take you a little bit longer to see a lot of the progress you're looking for. It all depends on you. So you can progress at everything, but understand that you have, it's like you have a certain amount of energy you can give to it, right? So as you do your three jujitsu sessions, that energy comes down a bit. You have this much left. As you do your three swimming sessions or whatever your other sessions are, that comes down, you have this left. As you do your other sessions, that comes down. And you can, you can spread yourself so much. So just try to think about what you're trying to progress at and handle it from there. Yeah, well said. And I would just say for myself personally, like after, you know, trying to chase the physique side of things in the gym for over a decade, wasn't quite getting to where I wanted it to be. And then about like eight months after jujitsu, I was like, whoa, I was focused just on jujitsu. I was, everything was for my performance in jujitsu. And I looked in the mirror, I'm like, oh, hey, I have the physique that I've always been chasing. So even though I wasn't focused on that side of things, because I had a pretty good base, <clears throat> that allowed me to get, you know, the, the aesthetic that I was going for. So depending on where your base is, focusing on the jujitsu side might like make the other thing happen automatically without really focusing too much on it. I would say just maybe don't lose touch of that side. So that's like, you know, if you're, if you're training six days a week in the gym, and then jujitsu comes around, like make sure you're getting two to three a week in the gym while the three, four days in of sessions in jujitsu. Cause that's essentially what I did and everything fueled performance. So like the way I was eating, the way I was training, everything was for jujitsu and a byproduct of that was I got in the best shape of my life. Now I'm not saying jujitsu will do that for you, but like I said, I had a good base and I was very consistent with it for, like I said, Eight months is when I was like, oh my gosh, like this is like this is awesome. And so now a year and a half in, I'm not training as much, but I'm still having like really a lot of success with like my aesthetics right now. now I'm definitely a little bit lighter, but I'm, I'm more than happy with it. One yeah. thing I'll actually to so Jay, I'm not sure if like when you say aesthetics, if you're trying to lose body fat or if you're trying to gain muscle, mm. but just make sure because what ends up happening with a lot of individuals who grapple is they end up eating less for some reason. I see that as kind of a trend thing with grapplers they don't eat as much as they need to eat to be able to perform and especially to be able to gain lean body mass over time. Mm. Um, most of them don't actually pay much attention to their nutrition. So <laughs> if you're trying to get bigger and you're doing jujitsu and you're doing weight training and you're doing some other stuff for your athleticism, you need to make sure that you're eating enough calories to be able to actually grow from the strength and conditioning work that you're doing yeah. in the gym. So you might need to be eating more if you want to gain muscle with the amount of expenditure that you're having on a weekly basis. So that's something you need to pay attention to. Might want to write stuff down too if you're new. Like I remember when I was uh, lifting, even the first couple of years, I just kept a lifting journal. I just had a, you know, just kind of looked like this. And I just like wrote in it and kept track of the weights. I just found it really useful. And then at the end of the week, I could look back at it. Um, I could look back um, a few months and say like, oh, you know, I did this particular lift with this weight. Let me see if I can do this for a couple more reps and stuff. I think when you're newer, if you're more advanced and you've been doing it for a while, it probably doesn't matter as much and you'll understand the weights that you're going to use on most things. But if you're newer, it might be a good idea to write it down. And then also never underestimate the power of a coach. You know, we have a good friend, Josh Setledge, who does some online training and coaching for uh, grappling athletes and stuff like that. So you might want to look into some of the information that he has online as well. What do you think about someone who's trying to progress at a bunch of things at once? Yeah, it depends on the base. I think that was really well put. And I think especially when we talk about m muscle and aesthetics, like a lot of people are potentially, ha I don't want to say potentially, but I know a lot of people, what they mean by aesthetics is really lose body fat, right? If they were lean, they probably wouldn't care how big they were because they would look bigger because they were lean, which in this case, depending, again, depending on the base, 
it takes such little exercise frequency to maintain muscle mass. We know that from a research perspective. So if the goal is jujitsu, which has a much higher ceiling of skill, right? Like if the IFBB pro card is the equivalent of a black belt, I mean, I don't know, everyone in here, give us a year and we could probably do that. But like, how long would it take me to get a black belt in like, and never at this point, probably honestly, never. I have too many things not attached to my body and you do it. So there's no way I'm going to get past <laughs> you. So it's like, fuck that. So the glass ceiling of skill is so high. And like any skill, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's um, playing an instrument, whether it's learning a language, it's, it's really frequency of that exposure at high quality, which is going to allow you to learn much faster, right? Skill acquisition goes through a three-step process of cognitive, associative, and autonomous. And you need to be sort of stoking that very uh, intermittently at, and, and at a high quality, right? So we know what you'd want higher exposures of the thing that has a higher glass ceiling of skill to begin with. So if you are you know, if you've been weight training and your base is that of someone who's lifted a little bit and you just want to improve body composition, I would really drop your weight training down to the minimum necessary dose of maintenance, to improve the caloric deficit or a surplus that you need to be in. And then, you know, allow that skill to really shine through without any interference. Because a lot of people, when they mean aesthetics, it's like, do you want to put on, you know, 15 pounds of muscle. It's like, well, probably not. If your goal is to also roll, that might be a little bit more difficult. So if you, the idea is to maintain the muscle you have while you get better at this skill, you know, obviously the calories in calories out conversation is going to be part of it, but understand like how minimal it takes from a volume perspective, from training frequencies a week to actually from the research, maintain the muscle that you have. Yeah. And Jay, if you join the Untapped Discord group, it's on my YouTube channel. Go join that Discord group. If you have like questions, if you let me know what you're trying to get better at, we can easily we can easily give you some suggestions for how you can set things up. So just join that Discord, and we can get you set up. I think All that right. was great. Hopefully, uh, no one missed that. But talking about like a, the acquisition of the skill, it can be hampered by you trying to go in the gym and like kill yourself with too much training. Yeah, so you got to yeah. be cautious of that. All right. Next question. Uh, this is a quick one, but does eating more on BJJ or any type of days help recovery? Always feel so worn out. Hmm. I would look at it maybe from a neurotransmitter perspective. It could be something to it, depending on a neurotransmitter, like signatures per individual are very different. Like you have some people who are very sympathetically driven, some people who maybe aren't. And then that'll change sort of the expression of what fatigue actually is, right? Fatigue is usually just a fundamentally, or at least part of it, is a depletion of neurotransmission or the ability to neurotransmit. That's part of fatigue. So there might be something to, you know, if you eat more carbohydrates, maybe that's releasing more serotonin. Maybe you feel better. And, you know, does this help from recovery? It's like, you know, I think we've kind of looked the other way now on the idea of an anabolic window. And really we understand that, you know, broader um, uh, swaths of time are more useful. Like, are you getting all the calories in? Like, are you're hitting this window? Great. Are you still deficient in your micro and macro nutrition? Um, but it could be, and this is really a question, of, and it comes down to skill level because the, the answer to the question, do you feel better, becomes more weighted the better an athlete you are right? Because they are so based off of feel, right? So if, and, and you know, I've seen some absolutely ridiculous nutritional strategies in sports and the more ridiculous usually means the better the athlete, right? Because they feel is everything, which is like, you know, data can say one thing, but, you know, and, and not to like, you know, Lane's data over feelings thing. And in the research perspective, absolutely. I mean, he takes it from a very empirical stance, but from a coaching standpoint, when we're actually looking at feeling the higher level of the athlete, the subjective interpretation is everything. So it depends. Like if you're a black belt and, you know, you're really, really high level, I'm going to really start to cater. And the, the thing that I'm most concerned with is how you feel. If you feel more recovered, well, guess what? You're more recovered whether the fucking uh, aura ring or the wearable says otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because you, you operate off feel. Every pro athlete does in every sport, even, you know, even the highest output strongman powerlifters still at that highest level, they are so attuned, right? So feeling is not something to be cast aside. Now, if you're on the come up and you're you know, maybe not as skilled, we might want to look for a air quote more optimized approach nutritionally to you know make sure that we're not going in a high enough surplus in these higher training days 
that across the course of a week, you end up gaining, you know, unnecessary weight and body fat that makes you more inefficient over time. But as you get better and you start to work through this, hopefully optimized framework, and there are things that you just like intangibles, we have to pay attention to that. And you'd be a stupid coach to not pay attention to that. It pisses me off sometimes when I like, like, I, cause I have an aura ring. I don't wear my Apple watch to bed, but uh, I have a whoop that I don't always wear, but sometimes I'll wake up and I'll feel fucking amazing. <laughs> And I'll look at that shit an hour later because I don't like looking at it once I get up and it's like your recovery is in the tank. Like, bitch, what are you talking <laughs> you about? You don't know I, me, son. I, you, right? <laughs> so it, it's, uh, it's shocking sometimes because sometimes it'll look really good and I'm not feeling great. But sometimes it's like shit. And I'm like, I feel really good right now. And I actually end up performing pretty well that day. David so Coggins like, needs a recovery app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or just yells at you. Everybody's 100%. Your, yeah. That you're that you're, uh, you're going to carry the boats. <laughs> <laughs> so many people would die. <laughs> so many would just be left on the side of the, the road. The side of the road would just be littered with humans trying to run. <laughs> and then the app is just stay, saying like, oh, you still have 60% or whatever it is. Yeah, like yeah. you've only went through 40% of mm -hmm. whatever you're capable of. I would say the the like the three things that definitely make me feel worn out after jujitsu, um, they're, they're very, very obvious, but it was like Monday. Okay, I went to open mat and then I did class and I went hard the whole time. It's like, oh, big shock tomorrow. Hey, you're really worn out. Or that night you're worn out. It's like, yeah, I went way too hard for like my rest and recovery or whatever. Yeah. Obviously, poor sleep. That's very, very obvious. The other one is uh, I just didn't get enough electrolytes in me. Like I would be super drenched. Like I've never done anything on a consistent basis where I am head to toe drenched in sweat. Like mm. no matter how many hours I've spent on a step, step mill, nothing comes close. So those things would make me feel worn out. And to this day, like I still, like if I, like I went Monday, Tuesday, I was kind of dragging my ass around because I was tired. But getting those things in line definitely help, especially with the whole thought of, all right, dude, I, I worked really, really hard Monday because of me at my skill level. Like I'm not as efficient as in SEMA. So like, you know, to go one round takes a lot out of me. One round for in SEMA is like, all right, cool. We're almost done warming up, right? So it's like, I have to really like manage that uh, and understanding, okay, Monday was tough. That means Tuesday, I'm probably not going to have the same amount of energy and so on and so forth. So maybe I need to like dial it back a little bit. So that way that day or that next day, I'm not like a walking zombie. It's very difficult for me to manage, but mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. I think like, let's not forget that you can encourage your body to make more energy too. You know, just by going outside, going on a walk, Sun. just all these things. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the micro dosing that you're doing, um, you know, do you feel better or worse after you come here, after you do some uh, jump rope? Better. Yeah. So I think a lot of times we think that like, oh man, I feel a little sluggish. I, I really need the rest. I'm just going to plop down in front of the TV and watch mm -hmm. TV and relax. And of course you need that. You do need some like downtime. I'm not saying that you never have any downtime, but the way for you to get more energy sometimes is to actually expend energy and get your body uh, revved up a little bit. So mm -hmm. you might want to give some of that stuff a try. If you're someone that's taking supplements or vitamins or anything to help move the needle in terms of your health, how do you know you really need them? And the reason why I'm asking you how do you know is because many people don't know their levels of their testosterone, their vitamin D, all these other labs like their thyroid, and they're taking these supplements to help them function at peak performance. But that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health for such a long time now, because you can get yourself different lab panels like the Power Project panel, which is a comprehensive set of labs to help you figure out what your different levels are. And when you do figure out what your levels are, you'll be able to work with a patient care coordinator that will give you suggestions as far as nutrition optimization, supplementation, or if you're someone who's a candidate and it's necessary, hormonal optimization to help move you in the right direction so you're not playing guesswork with your body. Also, if you've already gotten your lab work done, but you just want to get a checkup, we also have a checkup panel that's made so that you can check up and make sure that everything is moving in the right direction if you've already gotten comprehensive lab work done. This is something super important that I've done for myself. I've had my mom work with Merrick. We've all worked with Merrick just to make sure that we're all moving in the right direction and we're not playing guesswork with our body. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off any one of these panels or any lab on the entire website. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. 
There seems to be a lot of jujitsu questions one at the other after the other. So this seems to be the last one for bid from Luis Argeas. Tips for S and C programming, volume per muscle group slash frequency, etc. Tailored for jujitsu athletes, of course. Thank you guys. Do you have do you Mm, yeah, per muscle group is always an interesting approach when we look at strength and conditioning. I think if you can look at per muscle group training with some maybe uh, ancillary benefits to training muscles rather than just getting bigger, like uh, shoulders are probably a fairly common issue in jiu-jitsu, 100%. right? So, you know, if we think about training arms, a lot of times when we get into the you know, the injury prevention performance world, regardless of sport, we start looking to what I would call like intervalence. Like we start looking at issues at like the serratus and we start looking at issues at the rotator cuff. So I'm talking specifically about the shoulder. And it's like, okay, maybe our highest yield benefit with what limited training capacity we have in a concurrent program that has us rolling and training might not be to do the thing that gets our bicep the strongest, but integrates our bicep the best. Right, so like a high cable bicep curl, overhead tricep extensions. These are exercises given the length tension relationship of where we're training these muscles across their their strength curve, respectively. Right, like a fully shortened bicep and a fully lengthened tricep are going to be weaker. Right now, lengthened tricep and lengthened exercise seem to have some benefit to hypertrophy, but having the shoulder in this position, right, either like 120 degrees of flexion with you know, a little bit of, or sorry, 120 degrees of abduction with a little bit of shoulder flexion, or complete overhead for the tricep you're going to start to pick up some of those ancillary benefits of like, hey, you're getting some scapular upward rotation with the bicep. You're going to get some external rotation as well. And you're going to get a muscle that like attaches kind of like the arm to the shoulder blade, which is when you read that dead guy anatomy textbook and you look at insertion, origin, origin, insertion, there's always this thing of like, well, muscles move from insertion to origin. It's like, no, they don't. They move from the point that's fixed to the point that's not fixed, right? So the point that's not fixed move towards the point that's fixed. So it's like there's, when we look at, um, the rotator cuff, the reason people get very emphatic about this from an injury prevention standpoint, and regardless of sport, is like, oh, well, muscles move from insertion to origin. They originate on the scapula and insert on the humerus. So we're going to move the humerus towards the scapula. It's like, okay, you don't think your nervous system is just like very task oriented and goes, wait, we just need something that goes from the arm bone to the shoulder blade bone. I don't give a fuck what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you're now all of a sudden your delts, your biceps, and your triceps really enter into the chat when it comes to creating a robust shoulder. But if you're just doing a gun run here and it's press downs and preacher curls, you're not getting that integrated exposure of the bicep in these more unstable positions. So I think a joint by joint muscle group approach, hmm has some merit, but we need to think a little bit deeper about what the joint positions when we train these muscles are and how we might be really benefiting from the variability, deliberate variability of training these muscles in isolation with an undertone of integration based off the positions <coughs> we're training them in, right? So like direct calf work would be another one that comes in. It's like direct calf work to me is a foot mobility exercise, not ankle, foot mobility. Can I get a forefoot and a midfoot and a calcaneus to start to move independently of one another and just have this thing that sort of just leverages a foot? Most people feel it like this. It's not really about the direct benefit of massive gastrox or massive soleus. It's about the indirect benefit hidden through this sort of like vegetables ground up in the spaghetti sauce type analogy of like they're getting foot mobility in and don't know that they're doing it. And it's loadable and it's meaningful. And it's actually the rate limiter to them using their gastrox. So as the foot mobility improves, the gastroc strength and the Achilles resiliency will all improve as well. Same with this. It's like you're limited to how stable your shoulder is, not how strong your bicep is. So setting some of these more of the second, third order constraints that you can start leaning into, you know, whether it's deliberately put into a program and explained to an athlete or just, hey, here's what you're doing. Here's how you do it. Do it right. And you'll feel a lot better. So I think when we look muscle group to muscle group, we want to make sure that we're looking a little bit deeper at the variability of you know, the muscle's ability to express across its full range at the joint that it acts on, rather than just like, I want big biceps, big pecs, big lats, big calves. Mm -hmm. I think what's so simple. Yeah, great. <laughs> but uh, one thing too, I, I think to pay attention to, if, <laughs> if you're a jujitsu athlete that's working out in the gym, is um, lifting through like long range of motion for certain movements. So think about something like like a typical chest fly, right? Um, if you grab a cable or you're doing something here, allowing your arm to stretch here, right? And using a load that's comfortable, nothing that's way too heavy, because obviously you can do your your pressing movement. So you can do like a dumbbell press, where you can load it up. Right. But then if you have something that allows you to bring your arm out here, outstretched and bring it back, 
within grappling, within jujitsu, there's a lot of positions where your arm is going to be in a long stretch position, whether you're sometimes passing or whether someone has your arm extended and you need to do like a, a hitchhiker to try to get out. You need to be able to have strength in that extended position to be able to move and move your body to escape. But you also want to be strong enough in that position where you're not going to get submitted immediately. So you do want to take advantage of some movements in the gym to be able to work those ranges of motion. Um, I think another thing to think about too, if you're, again, using the gym to improve your movement ability for jujitsu is improving your spine's ability to move through different movements. Because a lot of the stuff that we do in the gym is with a neutral spine. So like a a deadlift or a squat. But if you can start working in certain things that, again, loaded conservatively initially, things like the Jefferson curl, things like the QL raise, that's going to put you into some lateral flexion of the spine. Load these things conservatively over time. Allow yourself to be able to relax with the load. So again, if you use a load that's too heavy, your body's going to be too tense. But if you can maybe work with light Jefferson curls with dumbbells, move through that range of motion, slowly increase it through weeks to improve your spine's ability to flex with some load, that can be something that's beneficial for your movement ability as a grappler. Because again, in grappling, there's a lot of positions where you'll see grapplers have to literally bend, contort the spine and move their opponent with a bended spine. And some individuals who don't have that ability, especially just coming off the street and coming to jujitsu, it, it's it's difficult to build that over time, but you can build some of these movement abilities in the gym. So th there's that that's just something to think about. There's a lot of ways that you can use the gym to improve your movement ability as a grappler. Um, something else like the horse stance squat. You know what I mean? Like taking a, it's literally like your your legs are wide in a 90 degree position um, and you're squatting all the way down, but you're working now the groin, the, the those muscles that are typically underdeveloped. And with grapplers, a lot of grapplers get a lot of groin injuries. Um, that's something that is like, usually a grappler will get it and then they won't they won't deal with it for a long time and just hopefully it goes away. But the thing is, is there aren't many, there, there are a lot of movements you can do in the gym like Copenhagen's, horse stance, squats, uh, even the good girl, bad girl machine. There's a lot of machines, but like if you can start actually working these areas, it's going to improve your resiliency in the sport because that sport is super dynamic. You're doing a lot of different types of movements and you can use the gym to improve your movement ability in those types of ranges of motion. I think it's just interesting because you, you, you said it really well, but I think someone can simplify it by just thinking about like, what are the muscles involved in my sport? What, what are they, you know, what, what am I asked to do in my sport? And then you can kind of apply it to the gym. Now you don't want to like, you know, just try to, uh, you know, attach a baseball bat to a, mm -hmm. uh, a cable machine or something like that. That might be uh, a little bit overkill and might not be what you need because you're probably practicing your swing so often and you probably need strength in other areas and in other ways. But, uh, you know, when, when I was thinking about what you were talking about, I'm like, wow, bodybuilders do that. Like intuitively, a lot of times power lifters will do that. We don't really know what's weak but we'll be like, dude, your hamstrings suck, you know, and you need to get on this because you missed your deadlift. We're not really sure whether it's your hamstrings or your glutes, but certainly by you doing more uh, glute ham raises isn't necessarily going to hurt. And a lot of times, you know, that is where you're sore after deadlifting. So you can kind of almost um, think of these things in reverse too, after you do training sessions and you get sore in some of these areas and you do some of the movements that you're talking about with the extra range of motion, we're really trying to stretch you're going to feel that all through your pack and all through your shoulder, much like probably getting stretched and moving in jujitsu. Yeah. All right. Next question from Dom Sornberger. He's here a lot. He is. Question for the muscle doc. Any tips for elbow pain while squatting? I know it's due to elbow flexion while my shoulders extended, but is there any stretches or exercises you would recommend? Mm. Yeah, it's always like, to me, I look at it like a straw that broke the camel's back, right? So a lot of times when we get our, because there's shoulder extension, which anatomically speaking is just referencing getting your arm to your side. So from a flex position to extension. When our arm is behind our body, that's called hyperextension. So when you're squatting in a low bar, and it kind of depends on your torso size, you'll notice that most bigger guys can get their elbows underneath them. They have a larger center of mass, whereas a really small female might drive her elbows all the way back and get more of that rotation demand of the shoulder, which might not. So if you're somewhere in the middle and that rotation demand is not being met at the shoulder, it's then going to take the hinge joint of the elbow and try and make a joint that just goes, you know, flexion extension and try and induce rotation. One of the issues that I see when appraising someone's technique and exercise selection with the elbow 
issue in low bar squat or the squat in general is what does that moment of hyperextension look like in the rest of their program, right? Because one, are they training it? Kind of brings back our arm conversation. It's like length and bicep is a really good place to start, you know, attenuating your shoulders to that position. Now, mm -hmm. you know, low bar squats are your low bar squats. I'm not going to like say change your technique to accommodate for some underlying joint mechanics. It's not really about joint mechanics, but lifting heavy weight. But there's sort of this principle that whenever my elbows to come past the plane of my body, it does it in an uncompensated fashion when it's somewhere between 45 to 60 degrees. So if I'm doing exercises where my arms are behind me, whether it's you know a fly machine or whether it's bicep curls, like what does the rest of your program look like? One, are we actually introducing that shoulder hyperextension in any sort of meaningful fashion? As we extend the humerus, we're going to have to internally rotate the shoulder, right? So like, can you do dips? Most powerlifters absolutely can't do fucking dips. And it's like, well, there's a lot of secondary and tertiary benefits to doing an exercise like a dip. One of the things I would always start with is like get them to film and send me or I watch them if I'm in person, all of the exercises that have their elbow behind the body, whether it's a row, whether it's a bicep curl, whether it's a dip. And I want to see if they're coming in at this plane around 45 degrees because if they're doing all their rows in tight, what ends up happening is they get a bunch of compensation to the anterior shoulder and they're not actually getting the rotation of the humerus required of us to get our arm in hyperextension. So I just take all of their, pro, like all of their behind their body movements, whether again, row, dip, press, bicep curl, whatever. And the first thing I do is I just move it out to that range where it doesn't compensate. Some, maybe sometimes they're doing stuff up here. Like, oh, I'm trying to work my upper back. It's like, dog, you're deadlifting like three times a week. I don't know if you have to do that. And if you do, get to here and stop because what happens is now you start to negate the rotation that or you don't have access to the rotation you need to get into hyperextension until we're here now i can no, notice on the front of my shoulders don't move when i'm back here when i'm back here now i'm hitting a hard block now i'm hitting a hard block so it's like well one are you training your L, your shoulder in hyperextension and if you are is it actually benefiting the underlying, like, is it adding to local inflammation at the elbow because we're having this compensation at the shoulder where the shoulder can't move, the elbow now has to move. So that's usually the first thing I look at is like, let's just remove all of the other noxious stimulus that you are unaware that you are actually putting your elbow through in a training week and then put you back in the squat position and see how you feel. Because a lot of times that deviating that technique might be detrimental to someone who might have a pretty well established and again like you're under the bar for such a minimal amount of time with the intensity being really high you should be resilient enough to be able to adopt the best technique for the heaviest squat without having to change your technique to accommodate for some of these more nuanced underlying joint mechanics you need the bar to stay on your fucking back so what I would do is like, all right, let's 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 take a look at the, the entirety of your program and see one, are you getting your arm behind your back ever? If no, do that. And if you are going to do that, make sure it's somewhere in this place where you're going to pick up a lot of that benefit of rotation at the shoulder without compensating at the anterior shoulder, right? So 45 to 60 degrees, pick a bunch of exercises to get your arm behind your body and then reintroduce the low bar squat. And then it might be a thing of on the other side, maybe you're just low bar squatting too frequently and you haven't cycled that out and some deliberate variability would be useful. Can you get in a front rack position? Powerlifters, I know. Now, mind you, there's a limit to this. Powerlifters, I know that can that can high bar squat with good technique and front squat with a front rack position never have low bar issues with or have issues with their elbows in the low bar. If you can get here, your shoulders are so that they're functional enough to be able to get here, no problem. So some of it might be, you know, is this a systemic load management issue of like your low bar squatting too much, too often? And it's not really the position that's the problem. It's the, the, the devil's in the dosage, right? You're doing it too much. Now might be a time to introduce some of this shoulder hyperextension work and underload that movement and maybe go to a safety squat, right? And not for the sake that you're necessarily running away from your elbow pain, but maybe just that's an indicator that you're just need some of that deliberate variability in your programming. Oh, uh, so incline curl sounds like it would be a decent movement. Dips, uh, any other recommendations for specific exercises? Rear delts. Rear delts, when, and this is what makes the rear delt, like training the rear delt the way you should train it, air quotes should train it. Uh, the rear delt is one of the only hyper extenders of the shoulder. Like if I get to here, my lat is done. It's my rear delt that takes my shoulder into hyper extension, but it's going to work best at this 45 degrees. So if you ever see someone doing a row for the rear delt or a fly for the rear delt, they're probably pulling and ending right here because this is where I can actually get the greatest amount of hyperextension. So I can get the greatest amount of lengthening and shortening. So I think rear delt, some sort of row, mid-back rhomboid that has an arm path at that 45 degree, incline bicep, either dumbbell or cable, keeping it at that 45 degree. 
cable cross body extensions. So you actually have to pull yourself into that position is really good. That's tough because it's really hard on the lower trap. Same thing with dips. When you do dips as a power lifter, most people get up here and the first thing they do is <laughs> they sink in the shoulders. It's like your shoulders are at the bottom position at the top. Where are they going to go when they're at the bottom? You can't go more bottom, right? It's a super trooper thing all over again. It's like, pull over, pull over. It's like, you can't. He's already pulled over. You can't pull over anymore. It's like when people start here, it's like, why? Because their low traps are weak. And it's like, they're trying to do Y raises. It's like, what? No, like your low traps stop your shoulder blades from going through your fucking ears. Like you got to start here at the top of the dip. And then at the bottom, be at the bottom at the bottom rather than being at the bottom at the top. And then when, and when you do that, you're going to end up at that nice 45 degree. So those are some exercises I would throw in like right away. Cool. Okay. All right. Two more questions. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Next question from Moose. To gain power and explosiveness in my golf swing, are there any specific workouts or training modalities you guys recommend? Or has anyone talked about this on the pod before? Also, Mark, we need the hat. Oh. This hat? <laughs> yeah. I guess. <laughs> do you work with golfers? I have. What do you what are your suggestions? It's so it's about dissociation, right? Like you can do all the strength and power stuff, but if you can't dissociate like we talked about like way, way earlier, the hip from the femur, or sorry, the, the femur from the pelvis. And this is now one thing that moves as one. It's less powerful than something that can have two joints independent to it create torque by moving in separate directions, right? Now, if the hip and if the hip and pelvis are just, rather than having this as a, as a opposing action or movement that creates eccentric load through the muscles that you're going to use, this is moving as one. Ow, I'm really weak in my low backers. Yeah, of course, because now the pelvis has to move at the lumbar spine. Instead of having the movement come from the femur into the pelvis, we now have this like unified joint that moves as one because we can't dissociate the two in different directions. Now it moves to the next place to find dissociation. So now you just see this like Charles Barkley-esque fucking backswing. And it's you, all you're doing now is you're taking a lower extremity, upper extremity, and just twisting those two points. It's like, well, yeah, you're going to end up with some issues in that joint in between, which is a lumbar spine, right? So I think it's really more of a attaining and maintaining different positions that oppose range of motion, right? So a lot of people focus primarily on the trunk. So I'll, I'll maybe highlight two that I think are really useful with golfers. One is going to be the hip airplane as just an ability to move through the frontal plane. That's purely frontal plane, you know, pelvic movement on a fixed femur, which if you think about a backswing and how they shift weight, they need to be able to find that glute. If they can't find that glute, they can't find hip rotation, right? So that's a really good one, I think, to start accessing the strength that you have or being able to express the strength that you have by being able to dissociate the femur from the pelvis. The second one, would obviously be trunk rotation drills. Now, this is where I think a lot of golfers and otherwise, uh, really any athletes, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's uh, football players or even general population, the idea of, oh, I need more thoracic rotation. And there's a lot of like thread the needle and around the world and book opener and all that stuff. And it's like, okay, when we're training trunk rotation, we keep this idea of you know joint dissociation in mind. One of the things that I see most often missed is Trunk rotation or rib cage rotation or T-spine rotation is not twisting. Twisting is just taking the same rib cage that doesn't move and moving it on the pelvis that doesn't move, right? That's your obliques that do that. Whenever we're introducing an exercise that's deliberately meant to improve trunk rotation, which is a big part of golfers, or in this case, more specifically, like T-spine and rib cage rotation, you need to use the muscles of the serratus and rhomboid to actually manipulate the shape of the rib cage left and right through rotation. So it has to be a push and a pull. That's how you train rib cage rotation. If you're just doing this, you're taking the same shitty immobile rib cage and just putting it in another place. It's not about changing the orientation. It's about changing the shape. So you have to use this lever system. Like your, your scapula sits on this muscular track of serratus and rhomboid up into the you know, lower cervical, down into the fifth thoracic vertebra on from the rhomboids perspective. And the serratus anterior really is your top eight ribs, right? And then, but when you do just twisting shit, it's your obliques and your obliques are your lower eight ribs. And so well, you want to create like actual rib cage rotation that's meaningful and dissociation that's meaningful. You have to get your shoulder blade, this one valence to move this way while your rib cage moves the other way. Because now you can actually start to generate torque between these rather than them moving together. Like if I was to do this, I'm punching Mark with my obliques, but if I can move, if I move my sternum towards my shoulder, I now create potential for torque to be generated between my shoulder blade and my rib cage, rather than just like the hip moving as this single thing that then has to find the next place to compensate and find movement. So if I had to like, you know, make it really simple, 
the principle of dissociation is the principle of athleticism, right? I always look at, you know, uh, bodybuilding as isolation, powerlifting as integration, and athletics as dissociation. Like those are kind of like the ruling principles of each of those physical endeavors, right? And now each one of them has a Venn diagram in the middle that benefits from, you know, one of those principles. But I would say athletics, and especially like golf, which is so multifaceted and multiplanar, you need to be able to dissociate you know, uh, adjacent structures. So those are two exercises that I think would be most useful and some cues that I think would help. You're saying uh, push and pull simultaneously. Is that kind of um, more like just like a mental cue or do you have like particular exercises that you think work well with that? Yeah, I think even the most basic underloaded is a really good place to start. Like if we're doing some around the world exercise where we're like faced up against a wall and we're in a half kneeling position and we have like our you know, opposite knee furthest to the wall out in front of us and we're maybe pushing in on like a yoga block, just the deliberate serratus anterior and uh, rhomboid, opposite rhomboid retraction as you kind of go around this movement is a really good, because if you can't get there unloaded, you might have some difficulty effectively loading it when you introduce weight, right? You're probably going to see that layer of compensation start to rear its head and start going into the obliques and start twisting, right? You brought up a really good point about the, the Titleist attached to, or the, the Louisville slugger attached to the thing. It's like you, and this is where golf especially has gone off the rails. You do not want to change the rhythm coordination and timing of a swing. Right. So you don't, with second of I had load, it's like my muscles going to, my body's going to prioritize the muscles that are strongest for the task. And it's like, you can't win a uh, uh, you can't win a fight with a serratus and rhomboid against the internal and external obliques and the QLs. You can't do it. They're just too big, right? So it's like once I've clipped in something here and I've added a bunch of weight, I've changed the dynamics, like quite literally the neurodynamics of my swing, and that could be potentially detrimental to a really sensitive athlete. So we want to make sure that most of these are actually done underloaded, and then it's that trail of breadcrumbs that we talk about. It's like if I can leave this out there for someone to know how to learn how to dissociate they'll pick up the attributes they need in the swing they've established to better express, right? They will biomodulate that adaptation to their swing. And when we start adding weight, that adaptation could be potentially detrimental because now they get used to using oblique over serratus and rhomboid. How about just using a heavier club? I'm joking. I'm joking. Well, especially in golf, like uh, you, know, you want to talk sensitive athlete stories, like I'm not going to name who, but there's a golfer who you can put his... So most golfers will put uh, like a, a, a quick roll of tape, not roll, but like a, a, a wrap of revolution of tape over their club before they put a handle on. So they put their grip on over top of it, helps the grip stay to the handle. There's a golfer out there, and I'm not, again, not going to name names, who can tell you the number of revolutions of tape you put under his grip without seeing it. Damn. Be like, there's two. He's like, no, there's not. There's one. Take it off. And then cut it off. And like, holy fuck. <laughs> So like, yeah, I don't think heavier wow. club is the move when homeboy's got like, I don't know, six, four grams of electrical tape and he can tell the difference between four and five grams of electrical tape. <laughs> that's so yeah, I, I wouldn't go heavier club with these guys. <laughs> A constant thing that's been beneficial for all of our health has been intaking enough protein, but also intaking quality protein. And that's why we've been partnering with Good Life Proteins for years now. Good Life not only sells Piedmontese beef, which is our favorite beef, and the main reason why it's our favorite is because they have cuts of meat that have higher fat content, like their ribeyes and their chuck eyes, but they also have cuts of meat like their flat iron. Andrew, what's the macros on the flat iron? Yeah, dude. So the flat iron has 23 grams of protein, only two grams of fat, but check this out. Their grass-fed sirloin essentially has no fat and 27 grams of protein. There we go. So whether you're dieting and you want lower fat cuts or higher fat cuts, that's there. But you can also get yourself chicken. You can get yourself fish. You can get yourself scallops. You can get yourself all types of different meats. And I really suggest going to Good Life and venturing in and maybe playing around with your proteins. I mean, going back to the red meat, there's pecania. There's all kinds there's of stuff. chorizo sausage. There's maple bacon. Wow. That stuff's <laughs> incredible. The maple bacon is yes, so good. Yes, maple bacon is really good. Yo, my girl put those in these uh, bell peppers with uh, a steak oh, and chicken. Yes. And oh my God, it was so good. But either way, guys, protein is essential. And the Good Life is the place where you can get all of your high quality proteins. So Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you can head over to goodlifeproteins.com and enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. All right, last question from our boy, Jeremy Avila. Hey. I was referring to the single leg RDL or airplane warmup from earlier. If they can't perform the movement correctly, how do you know if it's a neurological problem or something else? Uh, okay, so I don't know how you would differentiate anything outside of a single system. So neurological problem would be hard to define. First of all, high. 
I think uh, just friend of the show. I think it'd be safe to say friend of the show, Jeremy, who's also the freakiest, like, uncoordinated. You ever see him? What just, a mutant! I'm gonna do box jumps and do the splits yeah. at the same. Like, you're a freak. Hi, <laughs> man, miss you. Love you. Thanks for everything. Nine hundred three pound deadlift. No big deal. Yeah. What he got too? Yeah, I, I was there when he when he pulled eight eighty four. That was his PR. I know. I know for sure he did in training. I'm not sure yeah. if he got it in a meet. Yet. I feel like I'm outside of maybe his close family circle. Because uh, I used to cite him a lot and be like, no, deadlift 884, boss of bosses. I was there, big fan. Is that in? Wow, what a monster. And what a what a nice guy. Um, what was his question? Uh, how does he tell oh. if it's a neurological issue or something else? You know what? Yeah, that's tough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the answer to that. I would just say, you know, you have to regress the pattern and understand what that exercise is. You know, center mass and base support. If they have an issue, broaden the base of support. Right? We need to meet people where they're at. Now, sometimes broadening the base of support could be doing something like a B stance hinge, or it could be like, uh, you know, if I, there's a fundamental difference to the input of me holding on to this desk as I do it. And same applies for an airplane. If I hold onto this desk and my base of support is now the net base of support of my single leg and all this, so it's very stable. But if I grab like two dowels, right? So if I grab two like broomsticks and I hold them down, my base support is far less than if I grab this. So it's all just about like titration, right? Can I titrate that stimulus up to a point where someone is uh, uh, adequately challenged and stimulated without practicing bad practice, right? I watch people try and, take on the single leg RDL as like part of their training regime. And they're just like, it's so poorly executed that you're not actually driving underlying stimulus. Like just like any exercise, like if I did bicep curls like this and my arms didn't grow, you'd be like, well, yeah, then the technique matters. It's the same with sensory input as the driving uh, uh, or the preeminent adaptation of an exercise. If the idea is sensory input, it's like you have to actually be in the right position to drive the input that you want, regardless, same as the bicep curl. So I would go some sort of progression of like, hey, we're going to start you very, very stable, as stable as you can be on one leg, holding on to something like that has a broader base support. And then I would be like, all right, let's try two dowels. Let's try a dowel on the opposite side of the foot that's down. That'll have a net broader base support than when I progress it to let's try a dowel with on the, on the side of the leg that's forward. And then what I'll do is I'll go, I'll hold their hands. Now it's like, hey, real light in my hands. Now they're getting some reactive feedback. Now they, they grab when they need it, but it's not there all the time, right? So I'll just like, hey, put my wrists out and as they go. So it's really about, you know, progressing and regressing the pattern rather than like progressing and regressing any sort of load. So neurological issues, like when I think neurological issues, you know, we're talking like upper and lower motor neuron lesions. And like really, like that to me would be a pathology where you might see something, uh, uh, you might see some difficulty in interpreting their, their uh, position in space. But I would start just meet them by meeting them where they're at. And the way you do that is like, let's titrate up the amount of base support that we need as we deviate their center of mass. And let's just see over time if we can't consistently get some improvement of that subjective, like, hey, this looks better. And like usually when they, hey, it looks better, they go, yeah, it feels better too. I think Jeremy uh, works with some children and I think he works with some kids that have like autism and stuff. So that might be where the question's kind of stemming from. Yeah, yeah. And in that case, I mean, we know the heightened sensory or the, in a lot of those populations, what you're going to see is, is a lot of hypersensory disorders. Like we can kind of know that's how it works in the brain to a certain degree. So you can, you can potentially play with that idea of like, if this person is hypersensory, maybe we, maybe they like that sensation, right? Maybe what we do is maybe like the stuff you guys have here, some varied input on the feet. Feet are massive when it comes to the playing into what's called the sensory homunculus, which is basically like it's a it's a form of an image of how our body prioritizes sensory information from particular parts of the body. So hand and feet are our biggest, and our, our mouth and our lips are the biggest hubs for sensory input. So if you're trying to go down that special populations route, I would like lean into that and be like, all right, try different surfaces. Try the sand dune stepper thing that you guys have or try, you know, this irregular surface thing or try, um, you know, maybe like uh, one of those uh, tack board things. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing with hypersensory populations, then I would lean in with that. Cool. All right. All right, cool. Mark. All right. Check these winners. So guys, for if you win, uh, make sure that you are part of the Power Project Discord. Message me on there. If your name is pulled, please send me your email address, your address, and your name so we can get you your winnings. Dom Sornberger, <laughs> you win a pre pair of Vivo Barefoot shoes. So mention me in the Discord and I'll give you. Oh, is I'm, I'm, pull, I'm pulling one. I was wondering why you were like, was it arts and crafts later? Like, what is he cutting up over there? <laughs> I'll um, send you your free pair of shoes. Uh, Valerie Page? Yes. Valerie Page. <laughs> it's a, a, a routine winner on the show. I'm, she's uh, she's won before, and so her. is Dom. So, Valerie Page, you win a gift card. It's a good life. Um, 
These people are taking Next us for person. a ride. <laughs> He's getting hosed. Well, let's yeah. get some. Let's get somebody new. All right, I don't. I don't think Luis Arguez has won. You're gonna win a. Let's give you some joy mode. Yeah, Luis, we're gonna send you some <laughs> joy mode. And I'm glad I didn't pull for that one. I, I don't want an honorable mention. Whatever that night looks like. <laughs> I don't want to get tagged in that post. Um, uh, uh, Haley Neal? Haley Neal, you there win you a pair. Yeah, see, see, it's good we switch. Haley Neal, you win Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Haley's a woman, so sending her some joy mode wouldn't have been productive, I think. Well, it's, it's good for blood Careful. flow in general. Citrulline and arginine. Oh, mm-hmm. shit, you're right. Careful. I don't know. Gotcha. And those are our four winners. What about if your ladies like, you need this? Mm. And maybe like you get an argument or something. Like, I don't need that, bro. <laughs> That's just, what I would say. Uh, especially the bro part, too. Yeah. yeah, I don't need that bro. Yeah. <laughs> if you dug this live with Jordan Shallow, check out this live we did with Jesse Burdick, also answering all of your questions. And if you do want to join these lives, join our Discord. We mention when all the lives will be, and we answer all of your questions along with giving away some goodies. So check it out.